Live stream is started. Sergeant, can you start your recordings? PC recording good. Cloud recording started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Bradley, could you please give us the opening? Okay. Good morning and welcome to the to today's New York City Council hearing on immigration joint with housing and buildings. At this time, all panelists, please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or on silent. If you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we may begin. Thank you, uh, Sergeant of Arms. And buenos dias to everyone. I'm Carlos Menchaca, chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. We're joined today by Committee on Housing and Buildings, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Robert Cornegie. And I'd like to also let you all know that we are joined by Council Member Drum, uh, who is leading the resolution today that we are hearing. Council Member Chin, Jonai, Lewis, Brooks Powers, Kredencek, and Moya. Today, the committees will be conducting oversight on the housing disparities faced by immigrant New Yorkers and the programs and services and outreach conducted to address these gaps. The Committee on Immigration will also hear a resolution, pre-considered resolution sponsored by Councilmember Drum, which calls on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would expand the eligibility for disability rent increase exemption to include certain categories of immigrant New Yorkers who are currently excluded. I will let Councilmember Drum make a statement after we hear from Carnegie, uh, Chair Carnegie. Um, but let me just say that the city's rent freeze program is a critical lifeline for low income New Yorkers, vulnerable New Yorkers. It helps them stay in their homes. It keeps families together. There is no reason that proof of disability needs to rely on the receipt of federally funded benefits that are restricted to US citizens and certain immigration categories. We need this state legislation so that the rent freeze program can truly be for all New Yorkers over the age of 62 or living with disabilities. I wanna thank my colleague, Councilmember Member Drum, uh, for being a member of this committee, for being a past chair of this committee, and for being the current chair of the Finance Committee, for all the leadership on this issue. We need this state action now. Housing disparities such as overcrowding, rent burden, and poor housing conditions are an ever-present reality for many immigrant New Yorkers. Of the three million immigrant New Yorkers in our city, one in five live in overcrowded households and more than half are considered rent burdened as more than 30% of, of their monthly income is spent on rent. 16% live in apartments considered to have poor conditions due to landlord neglect. The last federal administration attempted to issue various policies targeting immigrants through rulemaking, such as the HUD proposed rule and the public charge rule, which could have reduced utilization of housing assistance programs like Section 8 and public housing, further causing increase, increases in unstable housing, overcrowding, shelter use, and ultimately increasing rates of homelessness. Immigration enforcement also increased during the Trump administration, tearing families apart. With the removal of the breadwinner, once self-sufficient self families were often devastated and forced to rely on social welfare programs to survive, in addition to facing trauma of a banished parent. This often left families unable to afford rent or with the loss of their house subsidy. On top of all of this, immigrants have continued to face tenant harassment and discrimination by landlords. And this has unfortunately gotten worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. As the pandemic has caused hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers to lose their jobs, undocumented individuals across the city are even more vulnerable as they are not eligible for any kind of government assistance. Federal stimulus checks or unemployment insurance are often left even more vulnerable to being harassed by landlords. 
Similarly, many of the housing programs available to New Yorkers fall under federal regulations that restrict access based on immigration status. As we are coming out from under a cruel and xenophobic White House, we have seen firsthand the power of organizing with the recently passed New York State budget that includes a historic excluded workers fund. We cannot stop here. And we must continue to work to push all levels of government to propose new guidance, new rules, and new legislation that formally ensures that immigrants have equal access to affordable housing. Thank you to the members of the administration who are here. I will note that I believe the, yes, uh, the commissioner of, the, of Moya, the mayor's office of immigrant affairs is not here. Uh, I am always disappointed not to have her here. Um, that's why we have commissioners. And I don't believe that the HPD commissioner will be here, but we are joined by the deputy commissioner to answer questions. Um, and so we are here to hear testimony of existing programs uh, and their impact with our first panel uh, and all the resources that are available. We're gonna talk about that today. So I hope we can chart a course uh, together to address these disparities. And thank you to the service providers who work tirelessly and creatively to house immigrant New Yorkers. Thank you to the staff for running this remote hearing behind the scenes, uh, including that ca uh, closed caption program. Thank you so much for making that happen today. Um, thank you for the staff uh, on working on the community uh, committee staff. My committee counsel, Harbani Ausha, policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, and my staff as well in the district, chief of staff, Lorena Lucero, Deputy Chief of Staff Cesar Vargas and Legislative and Communications Director Tony Sherito. And with that, I want to turn it over to Councilmember Cornegy, Chair of the Housing Committee, for his open statement. And while you get unmuted, we are also uh, joined by Councilmember Rivera and Councilmember Rosenthal. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Menchaca. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Uh, thank you all for joining this joint hearing with the Committee on Immigration, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Carlos Menchaca. I'd like to thank my co-chair for hosting this very important hearing with me, especially as timely as it is. The cost of housing in New York City continues to rise, affecting all demographics with low and moderate income. However, the rising cost of living disproportionately affects immigrants and people of color. On average, on average, immigrant New Yorkers are more likely to be rent burdened and live in overcrowded households compared to, the US, to their US born counterparts. In 2011, it was found that 16% of low income immigrant New Yorkers lived in apartments considered to be in poor conditions. Over 3 million immigrants call New York City home. We should be doing all that we can to ensure that they have a fair chance to live here in dignity with safe, decent, affordable housing as a critical part of that. Although there are a number of housing programs and resources to assist immigrants at the state and city level, there are still disparities in who can fully access them. New Americans who have not achieved immigration documentation on the basis of their immigration status alone have limited access to some of these programs. For a group that is already disproportionately living in overcrowded substandard housing, the problem is exacerbated by the fact that they don't have an equal share in public programs and resources. Nobody should have to live in substandard housing, let alone because of their immigrant status. Today, I committed to learn what the city can, do better, can be doing better to serve some of the most vulnerable members of our population. The committees will also hear a resolution as already stated by uh, my colleague, sponsored by Council Member Drum. Uh, we, we very much appreciate putting forward this resolution that would expand eligibility for disability rent increase exemption to include New Yorkers who are currently excluded because of their immigration status. Our city programs and laws cannot treat one person as more of a human than another person. Our laws are, are meaningless and they only apply most of the time. Nobody is safe until we are all safe. I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Committees on Housing and Buildings and Immigration who are present. I'll now turn this over to my colleague, Council Member Drum, so that he can introduce uh, his resolution this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Chaka and Chair Cornegie. 
Um, I'm really happy that we are having this hearing today on this resolution. Since I became a council member, my office has been helping constituents apply for what is popularly known as the Rent Freeze Program, which helps low income, older and disabled New Yorkers stay in their homes. In addition to meeting uh, financial criteria, recipients of the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption or SCRI must be at least 62 years of age. Recipients of the Disability Rent Increase Exemption or DRE must show that they receive federal benefits, mainly social security disability insurance or supplemental security income. These two benefits, SCRI and DRE, have been invaluable to many of the residents of Jackson Heights and Elmhurst and every neighborhood in the city. Representing an incredibly in immigrant rich district and having chaired the Committee on Immigration my first term, I always try to remain sensitive to the immigrant perspective. I bring this lens to my work as chair of the Committee on Finance, overseeing the Department of Finance, which administers SCRI and DRE. Sadly, much government assistance is denied to immigrants in need, and DRE is no exception. Many disabled individuals in my district and throughout the city are in ineligible for no other reason than their immigration status. They do not qualify for the relevant federal programs and therefore do not qualify for DRE. It is a fundamentally unfair, it is fundamentally unfair that the most vulnerable of the vulnerable are prevented from accessing the very programs that are supposed to be helping them. SCRI has been working to assist our seniors regardless of their immigration status, and there is absolutely no reason why DRE should not be doing the same. Since DRE is a creation of state law, we have to turn to Albany for a fix. Fortunately, Senator Gustavo Rivera and Assemblymember Jessica Gonzalez Rojas have stepped up and are in the process of drafting legislation to do just that. I wanna thank Chairman Chaka for holding this important hearing. I look forward to the testimony of our advocates about the special concerns that immigrants, including the disabled, face with housing. DRE is one of the best programs out there aimed at preventing homelessness and indigency, but it will not live up its, to its great promise unless all immigrants are included. And let me just say in conclusion, if I may, that uh, just last week we had a terrible fire in my district. Over uh, 100 apartments were destroyed and over 400 people were displaced by the fire. Almost all of them were immigrants, some documented and many undocumented. And of course, many do not get any benefits at all uh, because of their immigration status. Uh, but I do wanna thank HPD and the American Red Cross for doing all that they can to help uh, place these uh, residents in appropriate housing, at least for the short term, uh, in motels for right now, and extending the deadline that they can stay in the hotels, and also for uh, the work that they're doing to place them in uh, housing uh, as we move into the future. It's going to take a long time for these folks to get settled again. And um, um, it's really important that we um, give them every opportunity that they need to um, come back. It was, Talk about displacing communities. Um, when fires happen like this, communities get displaced and it's really important that we keep those communities whole. So thank you again. And I look forward to hearing uh, this hearing today, what people say in the hearing today. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, council member Drum. My name is Rabani Hujan. I'm counsel to the Committee on Immigration at the New York City Council. And I'm gonna be going over some procedural items. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called and I'll be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will consist of members of the public, followed by representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then additional members of the public will testify. 
I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. We will now hear testimony from our first panel. I'd like to welcome Fabian Bravo to testify. After Fabian, I will be calling on Mario Cortez to testify. Fabian and Mario will be accompanied by Raul Zambrano, who will be providing Spanish interpretation. Can we please unmute Ra Raul? I'm unmuted. I am Thank you. Unmuted. You may um, give um, instructions where you yes, will be hearing yes. from Fabian Bravo first. First, okay. Uh, buenos días. Yo voy a ser el intérprete para el señor Fabian y Bravo y para el señor Mario Cortés. Y el perro atrás, si lo pueden guardar, por favor. Este, es, primero va a ser el señor Fabian Bravo quien va a testificar. Y si por favor lo puede hacer pausadamente para que yo pueda traducir completamente su testimonio. Estoy listo cuando usted lo esté. Ok. Should he go ahead now? Um, yes, yes, he can begin. Oh, puede comenzar, señor. Señor Fabián Bravo. Buenos días. Good morning. Good morning. Muy buenos días a todos. Muchas gracias por... Eh, permitirme ser parte de esta cabina mi testimonio ante ustedes. Thank you all. Thank you for allowing me to give testimony before all of you. Mi nombre es Fabián. Soy miembro de la organización Vecinos Ayudando Vecinos y vivo en San Sepa. Uh, my name is Fabian, and I am a member of the organization Neighbors Helping Neighbors. Han pasado un año desde que la pandemia azotó mortalmente al mundo, y desde ese momento comenzó esa pesadilla. It has been it has been a year since the pandemic has affected the world. And that is when the nightmare uh, begun. That nightmare, esa pesadilla. Esta pesadilla está afectando emocionalmente, mentalmente, económicamente y espiritualmente a nuestra comunidad latina en muchos this, aspectos de nuestra vida cotidiana. This nightmare is affecting our Latin community in an emotional, mental, and spiritual way. Y es que no estábamos preparados a un tipo de pandemia de esta magnitud. We were not prepared uh, for a pandemic of this magnitude. Y por esa pandemia estamos viviendo en un caos de angustia y de ansiedad And por la preocupación that, de los efectos negativos de esta pandemia. Because of that pandemic, we're living the negative aspects of that pandemic. We are living in anxiety. Donde miles de personas hemos perdido a nuestros padres, hermanos, hijos y amigos. Y muchos tristemente no tuvimos la oportunidad de despedirnos de ellos en mi propio caso. Thousands, thousands of us have lost friends, family members, and unfortunately we were not able to say our goodbye. En nuestro caso, o en mi caso... En mi caso, mi cuñada y dos amigos fallecieron por causa de COVID-19. In my case, my sister-in-law and two friends uh, died because of COVID-19. La comunidad indocumentada ha sido afectada doblemente por esta situación. The undocumented community has been affected twice, if, twice as much because of that situation. Ya que además, esta, esta pesadilla no ha terminado. Other than that, this nightmare is not over. 
pues también estamos perdiendo nuestros trabajos como de limpieza, construcción, restaurantes, cuidado infantil. We're also losing our jobs in cleaning, in construction, in restaurants, in taking care of children. Lamentablemente no recibimos algún tipo de beneficios económicos como ayuda de desempleo o, o algún estímulo económico. Unfortunately, no we do not receive any type of financial uh, assistance such as unemployment since we do not have a social security number. Y todo esto nos está causando una crisis económica. Pues All of ya, that. Ya que tenemos más gastos fijos, gastos que estamos pagando como renta, comida, luz y gas. All of that is causing more financial burdens. Those are expenses that have gone up, such as rent, rent, food, and others. Y también el próximo mes de mayo de este año 2021 se vence la fecha límite de desagojos de los departamentos y los negocios en la ciudad de Nueva York. In month uh, is the day uh, in which um, evictions expire for the city of New York. Hmm. ¿Qué va a suceder si comienzan las demandas en la corte de vivienda? What is going to happen if uh, lawsuits start in um, housing court? How many people are going to be left without a home? ¿Dónde vamos a ir si nos des desagojan de los departamentos donde actualmente estamos viviendo con nuestros familia e hijos? Where are we going to go? if we are evicted from uh, the apartments where we are presently at with our family and our children. In my case, the owners of the edifice where I live have not been demanded four times. In my case, the owner of the house where I live has sued us four times already. Todas estas demandas hemos obtenido ayuda de organizaciones como vecinos ayudando a vecinos y yo soy asistente. All of these lawsuits we have received help from organizations such as neighbors helping neighbors, uh, organizaciones como vecinos ayudando a vecinos y cuál es la otra, señor? El Comité de la Quinta Avenida y Urban Justin Center. Urban and Urban Justin Center. I told you about Fifth Avenue. Sí. Como mi caso, hay cientos de personas que pueden perder sus departamentos en la corte de vivienda. Like in my case, hundreds of people can lose their housing in housing court. Y es que no contamos con el dinero ni las posibilidades económicas para, para pagar a un abogado. And we don't have the money or the financial possibility to be able to pay for an attorney. Y necesitamos a que organizaciones como el Comité de la Quinta Avenida, a vecinos ayudando a vecinos, nos ayuden con estos casos. And we count on organizations such as uh, something Fifth Avenue and neighbors helping neighbors so that they can help us in cases like this. Hay más organizaciones eh, por mencionar, pero son algunas. There are more organizations. Uh, Voy a mencionar algunas? No, por mencionar algunas. Um, just to mention some of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pero estas organizaciones, a su vez, necesitan fondos. These organizations, uh, at the same time, they need funds. Para que ayuden a las personas que actualmente y después de mayo 
vayan a solicitar este tipo de ayuda. So that they can help the uh, people that need this uh, at the present and are going to need this after May. Porque es obvio que se avecina una situación caótica por las demandas que se vienen. Ob Obviously, there is a chaotic situation coming up because of the lawsuits also. Pero en, en este momento, si nos anticipamos, nos podemos preparar a esta crisis que se avecina. If we anticipate ourselves, we can prepare uh, for this crisis coming up. Esta crisis que se avecina de desagojos de la vivienda y de los negocios aquí en San Sebastián. This crisis that is coming up with the evictions of homes and businesses here in Sunset Park. Por tal motivo, yo le pido en voz de toda la comunidad latina que destinen más fondos económicos a nuestra comunidad latina. Therefore, uh, I ask you Uh, on behalf of uh, my Latin community, that you send more funds to the Latin community, that you destine okay. more funds to the Latin community. Y que si es posible, ayuden a estas organizaciones y esas organizaciones nos ayuden a nosotros los inmigrantes. And if possible, that you help those organizations so that those organizations help us, the immigrants. Proyectos como ayuda legal con abogados para que nos defiendan las cortes de vivienda. With projects like uh, uh, help from attorneys so that they can help us in family court. And ayuda también legal en cuestiones de con los dueños de edificios que a veces nos discriminan y nos acosan para que nos saquen de los departamentos. Legal help with uh, owners of buildings who sometimes harass us so that uh, we are evicted from the apartments. Así como esta pandemia que no discrimina eh, edades ni sociedades, Just like this pandemic that does not discriminate ages uh, or societies. Esta pandemia de las, de, de las demandas que se avecinan tampoco van a distinguir ningún tipo de, de edad ni sexo. Hmm. This this, these lawsuits regarding the pandemic are also not going to discriminate race or sex. Y, pues ya hemos perdido mucho por esta pandemia. No queremos perder nuestros hogares. We've lost a lot with the pandemic. We do not want to lose our homes. De la manera más atenta, ustedes son nuestra última esperanza en esta crisis. You are our last hope in this crisis in the most attentive way. Muchas gracias por su atención a todos. Y eso es, Thank eso era mi testimonio. Thank you all for your attention and that was my testimony. Gracias, Fabian. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll now be moving on to Mario Cortez. Gracias por su testimonio. Ahora seguimos adelante con el señor Mario Cortés. Uh, buenos días a todos. Este, les agradezco este espacio para poder dar mi testimonio. Uh, good morning to all. I uh, thank you for giving me the space uh, to give my testimony. Mi nombre es Mario Cortés. Eh, my name is Mario en... Cortés. Yo vivo en el 229 I... de la 23 Street en Brooklyn. I... I, lo, I live at 229 23rd Street in Brooklyn. Tengo 12 años viviendo en el mismo apartamento y en esta comunidad desde el año de 1997. 
I've been living in the same apartment and in the same community for 12 years. It's been since 1997. Los problemas que padezco en mi vivienda son los siguientes. The problems that I uh, have in my home are the following. Falta de reparaciones en general. Falta lack de of general repairs. Lack of heat. Discrimination. Discrimination. Acoso y desalojo. Harassment and eviction. A los que añado los que estoy padeciendo durante esta pandemia. Uh, the ones I've added are the ones I've been suffering during the pandemic. Físicos, mentales y económicos. Physical, mental, and economic, financial. Depresión, estrés. Depression, stress. Ansiedad, insomnio. Anx anxiety, insomnia. Pérdida total de mi trabajo por un periodo largo. Sin total ingresos. loss of my job for a lengthy period, no income. Tener un trabajo sin beneficios por ser indocumentado, aún esté pagando mis taxes individuales. Repítame, por favor, no le oí el comienzo, señor. Ok. Tener un trabajo sin beneficios por ser indocumentado, aún pagando mis impuestos personales. Having a job without receiving any benefit, even though I am paying my own personal taxes. Estoy, estoy realizando el pago de la renta de una silla de barbería en la cual trabajo sin tener ingresos. I, I pay for the rent of a barber chair that I rent without having and without receiving any income. No recibir estímulo alguno de parte del gobierno durante esta pandemia. Did not receive any kind of stimulus payment from the government during this pandemic. Asimismo, no tener ingreso económico que me permita realizar el pago de mi renta atrasada del apartamento. And just like that, not having any income that allows me to pay for the rent of the apartment that is laid. Agradezco a la organización Vecinos Ayudando a Vecinos por abrirme las puertas y recibir su apoyo. I thank the organization Neighbors Helping Neighbors for opening their doors to me and giving me their support. Cuando se los pedí. When I asked them for it. Me han dado el asesoramiento adecuado a mi problema de desalojo. They, had, they have given me the adequate advice regarding my problem with the eviction. Que hasta el presente día nos mantenemos juntos en pie de lucha. To the present, we're still standing, fighting. Dándome a conocer los derechos que tengo como inquilino. Letting me know of the rights that I have as a tenant. Y poniendo a mi disposición y de 18 familias más representación legal para enfrentar este problema de desalojo en común. And giving me and 18 uh, additional families uh, legal support to be able to face this problem of the eviction. Por lo cual considero necesario. Therefore, I think it's necessary que dicha organización deba continuar recibiendo fondos económicos del gobierno. That such organization keep receiving funds from uh, financial from the government. Para continuar vigente. To continue being current, up to date. Ay ayudando a más familias en necesidades por ser abusadas. Helping more families in needs that were abused. Por ser la minoría y la más vulnerable. Being a minority and the most vulnerable. Ya que somos una comunidad de inmigrantes luchando. Since we are a community of immigrants struggling. 
por un trabajo, un hogar y una, y una familia. For fighting for a job, for a home and a family. No debemos olvidar que dicha comunidad ha sido fuertemente impactada por una gran diversidad de necesidades. We must not forget that this community has been largely impact, impacted, impacted because of a great need of diverse needs. Por mencionar algunas. Mentioning some of them. Salud. Health. Falta de alimentos, pérdida de trabajo. Lack of food, loss of work. Pocas horas de trabajo, falta de ingresos económicos. Few hours, lack of income. Compra de medicamentos, atraso en los pagos de renta, luz y gas. Purchasing um, medication, being behind on the rent and utilities payments. Pérdida de algún familiar por la pandemia, entre muchas más. Loss of a family member because of a pandemic, amongst many others. Por lo que considero y pido fondos de ayuda económica. Uh, I ask then for economic help. Levanto la voz por mi comunidad inmigrante de la ciudad de Nueva York. I raise my voice for the immigrant, for my immigrant community of the city of New York. Para ser escuchados y tomados en cuenta. So that we can be heard and taken into account. No deseamos permanecer invisibles en esta sociedad y ante los ojos de los políticos y los gobiernos. We do not wish to stay invisible for Uh, the society and before the politicians and the government. En esta ciudad que muchos otros abandonaron. In this city that many others have abandoned. Por tener la oportunidad de mudarse a sus estados de origen. Having the opportunity of going back to the states where they came from, their states of origin. Para evitar el pago de rentas elevadas. To avoid the payment of elevated rents. Para evitar acumuladas por motivos de la pandemia y falta de trabajo. To avoid accumulated because of the pandemic and lack of work. Que nos afecta a todos en general. That affects us all in general. Y aún más a un grupo de la sociedad mucho más, en el caso de nosotros, por ser la minoría de migrantes. In our case, uh, a lot more, since we are a minority of immigrants in society. Soy la voz de muchos que continuamos aquí viviendo. I am the voice of many of us that continue living here. Con un gran temor de que finalice la moratoria el día primero de mayo. With a great fear that the moratorium ends on May 1st. Y no contamos con los recursos económicos para resolver los problemas we, de nuestras viviendas. We do not have the resources to be able to resolve the problem with our, the problems with our housing. <clears throat> Por último, quiero agradecer a, a vecinos ayudando a vecinos a, por mencionar a algunas personas, Marcela, Kimberly, Aura, que se ha mantenido en la lucha durante año y medio en, en, los, en los acosos de desalojo que, que, que tenemos los vecinos de tres. Lastly, I want to say uh, thank the organization neighbors, helping neighbors. Especially Marcela, Kimberly, Kimberly yeah. and Aura, uh, who have helped us for uh, the last year and a half with the problems that we have facing eviction. Porque es posible que hoy en día estuviéramos ya desalojados. Because it's possible that at the present we would have been evicted already. Eso es todo. Gracias por escuchar mi testimonio.
that is it. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Y quiero decir muchas gracias a, a Mario y Fabián uh, por su testimonio. I'm going to say thank you to uh, Fabián and Marco for uh, for being here and for uh, speaking their truth. Uh, y aquí lo hacemos así, um, escuchando las voces de la comunidad, la comunidad inmigrante, tienen voz y tienen poder. Uh, this, is, this is what we do here in this committee is to really hear from people directly uh, because you all have power in your voice. Uh, y también quería men mencionar, um, señor Bravo, pienso que conozco su, su hija, Samantha. Um, uh, Bravo. <laughs> uh, alguien que lucha en la comunidad uh, tan joven. Y si puede, puede mandar mi, mis saludos, por favor, a su familia. Um, I was just uh, telling Mr. Bravo that I, I know her daughter who has been fighting on the ground. Uh, and testifies as a young person uh, in middle school, I think now, uh, and and so this is a whole, this is a family. The Bravo family has been fighting for a long time, and it's just great that that this this hearing is is going to start with these voices representing not just a Latino community but a community of immigrants who are experiencing this, and the agencies are here to hear firsthand what what is driving us as a city council, as a committee, as a joint committee, and as city council as a whole. So, muchas gracias otra vez por su testimonio, su tiempo, y la lucha sigue, y ojalá que muy pronto vamos a, a traer esta justicia que merecen cada, cada inquilino. Uh, and hopefully we'll bring that just, justice because of this work that we're going to be doing in this committee. So, thank you so much, uh, and I'll hand it back to committee council. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony um, and um, our interpreter for providing interpretation. Um, at this time, we'd like to move on to um, our next panel, which will be members of the administration. Testimony will be provided by Jean Bay, Moya Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Sabrina Fong, Moya, Deputy Director of Research. Ahmed Tigani, HPD Deputy, Deputy Commissioner of Neighborhood Strategies. And Anne Marie oh, Hendrickson, HPD Deputy Commissioner sorry, of Asset and Property, and property Management. Um, as a reminder, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use a Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Before we, be before we begin, I will administer the oath. Director Jean Bay, Deputy Director Sabrina Fong, Deputy Commissioner Ahmed Tigani, Deputy Commissioner Anne-Marie Hendrickson. I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Jean Bay. I do. Thank you. Deputy Director Sabrina Fong. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Ahmed Tagani. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Anne Marie Hendrickson. I do. Thank you. Director Jean Bay, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you so much. Before I begin my testimony, um, uh, Immigration Committee Chair uh, Carlos Menchaca, um, you may not know my name and you may not remember me, but I actually have been participating and observing and supporting your hearings and all of your briefings, et cetera, for the past year. And one of the things that I absolutely admire about working at Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is that despite what we usually think of as city bureaucracy and hierarchy, and before I came to Moya, I worked in different parts of city government, so I'm very used to it. But at Moya, we truly appreciate, you know, um, people's um, 
sort of expertise and their portfolio and their work. And it was our internal consensus that despite the fact that I am actually not a housing expert, um, we have HPD for that, but um, because all of my work, particularly during the pandemic so far, has been focused on immigrants' access to benefits. Um, that's why, um, and because Sabrina Fong has been doing all of our amazing data analysis work that you've seen in annual report and fact sheets, that we are the best person to um, provide the information here. And I am deeply honored, you know, I have watched you uh, Council Member Menchaka for a very long time, admired your work. Same with Council Member Chin, always, you know, uh, focusing on immigrants, Council Member Drum and all the other council members here. I know the work that you're doing for New York City immigrants, and that's why I feel very privileged to live in the city, work for the city. So I just wanted to make that note and I will start my testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Chairman Chaka, Chair Carnegie, and the members of the Committee on Immigration and the Committee on Housing and Building for calling this hearing. My name is Jean Bay, and I'm the Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. My role at Moya focuses on research, as well as helping and identify and address barriers to access public benefits and city services for immigrant New Yorkers. Every New Yorker, regardless of immigration status, deserves to have um, access to safe and affordable housing. This work goes well beyond Moya, and I'm happy to be joined by Ahmed Tigani, De Deputy Commissioner of Neighborhood Strategies at New York City Housing Preservation and De uh, Development, as well as um, Anne-Marie um, Hendrickson, who is also Deputy Commissioner at HPD at this hearing. Together, we have collaborated with many other partner agencies who have been ta um, tasked with making New York City an affordable city for all, which is a huge task, I understand. My testimony today will speak to the data on housing disparities facing immigrant New Yorkers and highlight some of the work Moya has done with our partners to address the housing related needs of immigrants during this pandemic. Access to affordable housing is an issue that affects all New Yorkers, but the needs are higher for immigrant communities. As of 2019, American Community Survey data that um, Sabrina has analyzed shows almost one half, that's 47% of all New Yorkers are rent burden, defined by the US Census Bureau as spending 30% or more of their household income on rent. This problem is greater for non-citizens Council Chair, uh, member, uh, Committee Chairman Chaka pointed out in the committee report um, with the percentage of rent burden New Yorkers highest for undocumented immigrants at about 51%. One in five immigrant New Yorkers reside in overcrowded households defined as having more than one person per room. This includes an approximately 8% of the total immigrant population who live in extremely overcrowded housing defined here as having more than 1.5 persons in the room. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here about this. The pandemic has exacerbated these barriers. Higher rates of overcrowding have made social distancing more difficult for our immigrant communities. Moreover, many immigrants and mixed status families were left out of federal stimulus relief, even though immigrants have shown to be more vulnerable to the economic impact of the pandemic and contributed so much to our society as essential workers and many of them taxpaying social members. While the state and federal eviction moratoria provided temporary relief for many families, housing insecurity is interconnected with underlying socioeconomic disparity and challenges immigrants have faced long before the pandemic pandemic, um, we understand that. So the city has taken steps to address affordable housing issues from the very beginning of this administration. The fight for affordable housing is a multi-pronged one with various agencies providing support for uh, to address homelessness, provide tenant protections, and the creation and preservation of housing stock. My colleague from HPD can provide additional details about the ways in which the city has tackled affordable housing, including those for immigrants. I also want to recognize the role of HRA Office of Civil Justice, the Mayor's Office to Protect Tenants, and the City Commission on Human Rights in ensuring that all New Yorkers have access to the housing they need and know their rights. Moya's role in this area is to advise the agency partners who are focused on housing issues, on immigration specific issues, serve to amplify the unique needs of immigrants and share crucial information with the immigrant community. During the COVID-19 pandemic, as it became clear that federal assistance would not address the urgent needs of our immigrant, immigrant population, 
Moya worked with agency partners in identifying ways to alleviate the immediate housing needs of immigrants. While Moya was able to advocate for and help secure private funding for direct payments to immigrant New Yorkers, as you're well aware, we also recognized that further housing specific support was needed. Through Moya's and city, including HPD's strong advocacy, we secured 12 million from various private funders to serve those unable to access traditional rental arrears um, assistance programs. Building on the existing and successful efforts of the home-based program in keeping New Yorkers in their homes, the funds and services for tenant experiencing need, which we call FASTEN program, has helped vulnerable and underserved New York residents stay in their homes during COVID-19 by providing them with rental arrears assistance, landlord mediation and legal assistance, financial counseling, job search assistance, as well as referrals to resources like food, affordable, health services, utility arrears assistance, and other services. So for those who have, um, you know, Mr. Um, Bravo and Mr. Cotes who testified before, I want to make sure that you are aware of these city resources and take advantage of them. They are looking for you and wanting to help you. Further, at the onset of the pandemic, Moya helped identify that immigrants were more likely to reside in overcrowded households and work with New York City Health and Hospitals to inform the creation of the city's COVID-19 hotel program to help all New Yorkers safely quarantine or maintain social distance from their family, loved ones, or other household members as needed. Moya also worked with the program to address concerns raised by immigrants on a variety of issues, including concern around language access, privacy, and child care. We also work to ensure program information was made available in multiple languages and promoted the program through our various digital and in-person outreach. We collaborated with h, h to create videos providing a tour of hotels and explaining the application process. This is in addition to the day-to-day -day work of Moya to promote um, the various housing resources available to New Yorkers. Throughout the last year, Moya shared information about FASTEN, Home Base, the Tenant Helpline, as well as the newly updated updated Housing Connect 2.0 to tens of thousands of New Yorkers through New York rights presentations, direct outreach through your apps and our other programs that we, we work with other CBO partners to provide services. Housing Connect 2.0 is a new affordable housing lottery system launched by HPD that expands access and opportunities to all New Yorkers in need, regardless of their current immigration status. In 2019, HPD established an alternative option to credit check by allowing applicants to provide 12 consecutive months of rental payment history, essentially eliminating the requirement of social security number or individual tax identification number, which was a huge win for immigrant communities. Additionally, Moya recently collaborated with HPD to ensure IDNYC would be accepted uh, as a form of identification in the new system. HPD's Housing Ambassador Program provides direct assistance for this housing lottery process, including working with applicants to obtain an um, ident IT and um, fill, uh, filling out the application forms. Housing ambassadors serve New Yorkers where they are and in their language, and HPD offers this training to any council staff. About 50 local organizations participate in the program and they collectively speak more than 20 languages. Moya also supports our agency partners in addressing the language access needs of tenants. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Moya helped translate critical materials that mayor's office to protect tenant develop related to the eviction moratorium and eviction prevention. Moya also worked with MOPT to make sure its website was more accessible by adding multilingual links on its homepage that connect users to translated information and resources for people impacted by <coughs> Finally, Moya also works with our agency partners to oppose political changes that would exacerbate housing challenges for immigrant New Yorkers. As just one example, when HUD proposed the now withdrawn rule to bar mixed status families from residing in public housing or receiving Section 8 benefits, Moya worked closely with agency partners to oppose change through the submission of a multi-agency federal comment. This is in addition to working with these same agencies to oppose the public charge changes, which had housing implications and which would have devastated our immigrant communities. And I strongly believe that it is through our um, litigation advocacy that public charge rule was um, blocked and um, ultimately have been withdrawn under this administration. 
As I mentioned earlier, Moya and the city are gratified to see that the city has committed billions of dollars to providing much needed support to immigrant New Yorkers, regardless of their immigration status, both in rental assistance and more generally. This support will help address some of the immediate needs of immigrant New Yorkers, but we also know, and I am painfully aware as also an immigrant, that more work needs to be done and the city is committed to making continuous efforts to achieve affordable housing for all. I look forward to addressing any questions you have and discuss this issue. Thank you all again for holding this hearing. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to just acknowledge that council members uh, Eugene and Cabrera have joined us. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to questions from Chairman Chaka, followed by Chair Cornegy. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Chaka. Yes, thank you. And uh, if Chair Cornegy is here, uh, do you want to ask questions first? And if not, I'll, yeah, go ahead, Chair Cornegy. I'm sorry, can you hear me? We got you. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, so let me just get to, I'm assuming I'm at the questions portion of this. I apologize, I, I, got, I got a dead signal. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm handing it over to you for questions and then I'll take on questions and, and then we'll hand it over to the committee members for questions. Okay, thank you. So, um, has Moya seen federal rule proposals such as the proposed HUD rule and public charge rule under the prior administration affect immigration, New Yorkers pursuit of local housing assistance programs? And if so, how? That was a big question. Did you guys get that? Yes, are you asking if you know of the rules or uh, our response? I can answer, yeah, the questions. So yes, we are, um, unfortunately very painfully aware of the HUD rule that was um, essentially trying to exclude mixed status families from being able to live in um, you know, um, federally assisted housing as well as the public charge rule, which we have um, played a, a, a very, in fact, uh, many of our staff have spent many, uh, much of their time on in um, responding to that would have made it really difficult for people to access various very, very critical public benefits uh, benefits, including Section 8 vouchers and certain housing assistance that are more provided directly through cash assistance. We have provided um, comments to the federal agencies um, addressing, you know, our concern and the uh, devastating impact it would have on immigrant communities, the importance of providing the support to immigrant communities um, in Con, uh, you know, coordination with HPD and many other agencies. We have also, um, you know, uh, done a lot of direct advocacy, including filing a litigation in case of public charge rule, which has resulted in, in fact, a preliminary injunction, although there were so many times the injunction was blocked and then went forward that it's kind of hard to keep track of, you know, what has happened. And we are very relieved to know that both of those rules now have been withdrawn by the new administration. And we fully understand that now the biggest issue is public messaging that, you know, not all immigrants are aware of the latest development of these policies, that meaning these policies are gone, which is why we are still committed to um, continuing our um, support not fear campaign, which is our advertising and digital marketing um, campaign to and as well as a, um, a yeah, campaign to make sure that immigrants are aware of the city resources to consult before they think about applying for applying for or withdrawing from any public benefits, encouraging them to make use of those resources. And we are doing the same relating to how to grow, uh, work as well, working closely with NYCHA, HPD and other agencies to make sure that immigrants have full information about what's going on and do not feel discouraged about um, utilizing benefits that they're entitled to and they should um, utilize. So, so thank you for that. Um, if there's a way that both myself and obviously Councilman Chaka's office can be uh, instrumental in disseminating that information to our respective communities, the immigrant communities at large, 
uh, certainly I, I'd like to offer an opportunity to do that in partnership. Of course, I mean, council, uh, you know, uh, uh, committee chair um, Cordigan, com particularly committee chairman Chaka, both of your offices have always been incredibly helpful to us in disseminating information. And in fact, I believe we um, regularly and our um, information, latest information on policy changes or new resources that we get through your office. And we will definitely continue to do that and would love to brainstorm about what is the better way to um, uh, proactively do outreach to immigrant communities to make sure that this information is out there. Uh, thank you. So in, in 2019, Moya worked with HPD to alter the housing lottery rules in a way that expanded eligibility to immigrant New Yorkers. What other ways can the city alter its eligibility requirements to program applications to extend more housing assistance to more immigrant New Yorkers? From Moya's end, because um, we, um, um, I think probably for the best given my knowledge of housing that we don't directly um, address the actual laws and policies relating to um, you know, uh, immigrants eligibility for programs, but we always work together with and advise relating to the impact of these different eligibility restrictions on immigrants. And relating, uh, you know, 2019 change to Housing Connect has been such an exciting development for us. And we have done, um, you know, a lot to basically um, promote that information to different communities through our communication channel, our outreach, know your rights um, presentations and these different ways. And um, relating to any um, you know, further policy changes that we're contemplating. Um, as of now, for the, uh, because of the sort of imminent people's imminent concern as testimonies have um, um, provided about um, sort of rental arrears and the burden of having to pay for the rent and the concern about housing direct, uh, imminent immediate housing stability during the pandemic, that was sort of what we have been mainly focused on. But furthermore, long-term housing, which is obviously much more important than providing stability and how policy changes um, sh uh, are being considered, I defer to you. And Ahmed, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, good morning, uh, chairs, and thank you, and members of the community. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on this topic. Uh, just because this is the first time I'm getting to speak today, I just want to also thank Mr. Bravo and Mr. Cortez for their comments today. As someone who long ago with his family also received help from uh, the same organization, Living in Sunset, uh, lucky enough to receive a housing voucher and be able to grow and be a part of the city, I truly recognize where that gratitude comes from and also recognize them as a great organization. Um, building on the comment from my colleague from Moya, for us, we, we are looking at ways just to reduce the barriers to be, being able to access these services. It comes from a couple of things. A, we have to meet people where they are. We need to make sure that we know how best they are able to receive this information, especially in this uh, cri ongoing crisis, whether they are home, whether they are essential workers and their time is limited, and how best to deliver that message to them whether it's through a virtual communication, whether it's through in limited in-person, socially distant, um, safe uh, contact. We are talking with our community partners on the ground, which comes to our point two, working with those who work in the community, have that credibility, are recognized as having that best interest. Again, given the comments made earlier about what we're coming back from, uh, a, a place where government was seen as coming after their status. We want to be of help to them. And we know that that is a long, that is a long road that requires us to show up, provide help, and to bring people with us who have been helping them all along so that they see we're doing this in partnership. We have to make sure that we're doing this in a way that is culturally sensitive, that is recognizing the various and diverse and, and large array of languages that are spoken in our community and putting people in the field who are able to deliver this message, whether virtually or in person, making sure that the translations are accurate, making sure that we are getting the right connotations and the right translations, getting the right message out there. We also need to make sure that we are uh, doing this in a way that we are being both present at different times. We can't just be available to, to provide this information at one particular hour and assume that we're gonna get everyone we need. These are people who are essential workers. These are people who, who work non-traditional jobs, non-traditional lives so that they can make means and live and be a part and give back to the city. So we need to, again, meet them where they are. 
And from the rules and the regulation perspective, you already see from the housing lottery perspective where we are trying to find ways to be flexible, to show the, 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 the points that we need to show without using uh, restrictions that may be unattainable or hard to get for our, immigrant, our fellow immigrant New Yorkers. And if there are other ways, we'll continue to do so and we welcome any ideas. So thank you for that. Um, I, I have a question and I'll come back uh, to another round if I have the opportunity. But uh, my, my final question in this round is, so this particular hearing was about obviously um, uh, Council Member Drum's resolution, but the, the real theme of it was that there is this segment of our population that finds itself generally ineligible for the services that are that are available. Even the ones that are eligible are on the margins and the fringes. So, but there's a, there's a huge portion that is ineligible simply based on their immigration status and 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 from and for myself and also obviously for council member Menchaca, uh there's way too many people who fall into that category who are now rent burdened and who are in uh, substandard housing and overcrowding and all those kinds of things exacerbated certainly by the pandemic um, I'm curious as to what partnerships with CBOs has Moya leveraged to provide housing assistance for those immigrants who, like we've said, are currently ineligible for federally funded programs. Absolutely, thank you for the question. And um, you know, as uh, in my office, um, they jokingly call me as a COVID czar. And so, as somebody who has been working on the pandemic response, I mean, there is a question that's more. You know, there is no question that goes more straight to the heart and just like you know breaks my heart than that one. Um, definitely, you know, undocumented immigrants have been disproportionately economically you know affected in terms of losing their jobs, losing their income. Not being able to find jobs, having ex uh, increased expenses. They also had a disproportionate health impact of losing their family members and being themselves sick and having all those issues. And yet they are systematically excluded from the existing public benefits. We, um, you know, part of this is a, a terrible federal law that exists to uh, restrict any federal benefits from um, being available to immigrants as well as making it um, preventing state and local governments um, for the most part and being able to provide um, sort of more direct uh, public assistance to undocumented immigrants and all those sort of legal um, barriers make it really challenging immigrants to access these benefits. But it is precisely for this reason that at the beginning of the pandemic, our primary focus has been um, trying to deliver as much of a direct assistance. In fact, we know that cash is the most fungible thing and most useful thing for people to have in their hands, at the, you know, at the, especially in the moment of crisis. And um, um, so that's why we re uh, launched the COVID-19 emergency relief program in coordination with um, Open Society Foundation, and it was twenty million dollars, which you know sounds like a big number, but it's just tiny drop in the bucket compared to the need. But still, we were extremely grateful, and uh, you and we work with the specifically work with community-based organizations to provide this funding to immigrant communities because of the trust that we have in these um, CBO's relationship with the communities and their ability to assess the needs of immigrants and being able to provide direct support. And from that, you know, we are able to track at least some of the spending as to how the spending was done because the money was provided through a prepaid card, although um, a lot of it, um, they, they were able to just with Withdraw cash, so a lot of people just decided to withdraw cash directly. And from that, and based on what they have reported as their needs, we know that you know, in fact, number one needs that they have identified is being able to pay rent. And so we know that that was like one of the critical issues, and that was you know what we were focusing on in providing assistance. And we knowing that rental assistance provides such a critical you know uh, such a, a big imposes such a big pressure on immigrant communities. That's why we work together with HPD, DSS, and you know other partners to launch the um, FASM program, which is again going around the legal barriers that you have just identified in um, cities um, 
existing funding that um, cannot uh, directly go to immigrants um, through the assistance of private partners. We raised 12 million and that um, allowed us to help immigrants, undocumented immigrants who cannot get these assistance to get the rental assistance, including rental arrear payment, um, negotiating with the landlord, as well as um, identifying potential new housing that will provide more stability and including, for instance, um, a case of like first month and deposit and a lot of the other wraparound, you know, assistance that they need. So those are sort of the main things that we have worked on. And I will um, also pass it on to Ahmed to um, chime in with the amazing work that HPD has been doing. Again, thank you for that comment and the opportunity to add. I think it's uh, what's important about FASN is also to recognize that these organizations that we work with also overlap with much of the other work that we do, whether it be one of our you know, 50 plus housing ambassador programs located throughout all the five boroughs. Uh, they are part of our protective enforcement strategy. Uh, you know, there is, there, there is seriously a need, and I, I agree with you, Chair, that we need to expand the options here. One thing is to provide uh, affordable housing that uh, to help with mobility. The other is to make sure the housing that people have is safe and that if there are issues with that housing that we are out there doing enforcement. Uh, as you know, we have an aggressive tenant harassment strategy that collaborates across city government that includes the mayor's office to protect tenants, includes MOYA, includes Department of Buildings, it includes state and um, other, other partners who focus on housing, who focus on special investigations. We, in uh, last year alone, we did 1,500 buildings. Uh, we are aggressively taking landlords to court. If there are issues, we are forcing repairs. We are making sure that when recommendations come our way, we are, we are, we are going after those bad actors. In addition, we're not waiting for people to come and issue complaints. We have or organized work throughout, especially, especially communities of color throughout uh, the city where we are working hand in glove with organizers in buildings. And I, I also want to recognize that what's very important during this time of COVID is tenant organizing is a very personal relationship that's built between the people in the building and the folks who are there to help them make that work happen, whether it's them themselves, their neighbors involved, or an organization that comes in who cares about their neighborhood. We recognize that COVID has brought up a lot of questions about how tenant organizing is going to happen before. And I am amazed at how creative and dynamic and persistent people are about making sure this work happens. We're learning a lot about how, again, to approach the mixed method of both virtual and in-person so that we continue to get this information, continue to do our collaborative work with, organ with agencies like DOB to make sure that we're looking at both the housing maintenance code and the building code so that if there are issues, we're addressing them all in one swoop so tenants don't have to wait much longer to get those issues addressed. Uh, thank you. I'm going to turn it back over for questions to my co-chair, but I, I want to say um, housing and building perspective, it is absolutely a priority to make sure that there is safety and, and that the, you know, that our communities, which are living on the fringes and, and, and are susceptible to um, uh, uh, overcrowding in some instances, but also just unsafe, unhealthy conditions um, are not fleshed out to hurt the tenants, but actually are fleshed out so that we can provide the necessary safety so that people can live with a quality of life, no matter what their immigrant immigration status is, um, as any human being should do. So, so my commitment from the housing and buildings chairmanship uh, remains. I look forward to a continued partnership with Moya, certainly a continued partnership with um, my co-chair, Carlos Menchaca, to ensure that as a city and at these two committees, or my committee at least, um, uh, has a sincere focus on making sure that we can provide safe, affordable housing to every single human being in the city of New York. So, so thank you. Um, my co-chair is gonna take over for me. Um, I will be returning, um, but I'm leaving it in probably the most capable hands for this topic. Uh, that I know in the New York City Council. Thank you, um, Moya, for your testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Menchaca, for your partnership. Thank you, Council Member Drum, for always being a stalwart on issues that are germane to, to, um, to, to, to marginalized communities, and in this case, uh, our immigrant community.
Thank you, Chair Cornegie, uh, for that. And I look forward to continuing this, especially some ideas that are already popping up in my head about how we can how we can really bring that uh, to fruition. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Perkins as well. Uh, and I'm gonna hold my questions uh, and pass it over to uh, council members who have questions before we start losing any of them. This is a really important topic and I wanna hear from them as well. Uh, Committee Council Harbani Uja. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm gonna be calling on council members in the order in which they've raised their hands. Um, just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in order. Um, we'll start with council member Chin. Time begins. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I also have a youth service committee hearing that just started. Um, and thank you for allowing me to ask the question first. Um, it's great to hear um, all the great work that Moya and HPD has been doing to help immigrant uh, tenants during the pandemic. What I wanted to touch on is that how do we create more supply of affordable housing um, that immigrants can apply for uh, whatever their status is? And now there are limits because you know, a lot of the new project, if they have federal funding, then immigrants who are undocumented is, is not qualified. But the city can offer that flexibility if we can look at getting you know, private investment together with city funding resources to create more affordable housing. So I guess uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner <laughs> Tagani, uh, Abbott is really seeing you in this great new role. And I wanna really um, work with HPD to really strategize, like how can we create the affordable housing that's greatly needed? Like for example, in my district, we're trying to legalize, uh, as uh, Chair Koenigy talked about, how to make housing safe. I mean, people are already living in those situations where it's not an apartment. They just have a, a space that they could afford. Um, they share kitchens and they share bathroom, but it's affordable. And a lot of them living there are seniors and immigrants, and some of them are undocumented. And, and I wanna look at HPD in terms of finding resources to help uh, these type of housing to become legal. The other is that how do we look at um, through rezoning and we're creating affordable housing, how do we make sure that those housing that we create are open to everyone and not limited uh, to only people uh, who are documented? I think that that is the second thing. The third thing is that I know the city and the administration, the mayor expanded this home share program. Um, they were targeting seniors and that creates opportunity um, for seniors that might not have, you know, all the paperwork to uh, apply for uh, government, you know, senior housing. But that is a great program. But oftentimes, what I've seen is that the the rent is too high, right? So how do we create some subsidy to allow these seniors to take advantage of home share program? Because you might have another senior who happened to have a house and they have a two bedroom apartment and, and they can have a roommate. Uh, but what they're charging is a lot more than what a regular um, low income senior could afford. And how do we create programs where city can buy, provide some subsidy so that we can really fully utilize uh, some of these programs. So um, Deputy Commissioner, I know that you're part of like the strategic thinking there, how do we create more affordable housing and, and legalize some of the, uh, the units that we already uh, have in the city that immigrants are living in there? How do we make it safe and legal and affordable? Well, Council Member Chen, again, thank you for that question. Uh, there, are a lot of many, there are a lot of different parts to that question, so I'll try to address what I can in different segments. But I think where you are and where we are as an agency is exactly in the same place. Uh, we want to create as much safe, accessible, quality and equitable housing as we can in New York City to make sure it's accessible to the greatest number of people. The mayor's housing plan, as you know, has been an expansive effort to try to create and finance uh, 
that type of housing. As of March, we've already financed approximately 178,000 affordable homes. That's enough to serve nearly 450,000 New Yorkers. Uh, you know, within that, we have made a commitment to both make a serious uh, allocation towards senior housing and housing for those who need uh, extremely low or low income housing, uh, you know, for units that are between 30 and 50% AMI, um, we are at uh, building housing for families that make around 31,000 uh, per family. And we've built already 3,511 units. Again, while that's a, a great number, we know that we have to do more. The, the goal toward building housing is two part. Our pre-development work, uh, where we are leveraging public sites and both in our development teams, where we're working with owners and, uh, and landholders to bring them in and figure out the best way to move it toward a affordable public purpose for building on those locations. Uh, we worked with you success successfully to bring uh, quality senior housing to your district. We try to replicate those kind of conversations with the community so that we make sure these developments are successful. Um, the, I think the, the, the big part of it beyond those standard yet very complex development projects is our ability to think outside the box. So, you know, we recently, not too long ago, released Share NYC as a proposal and a plan we want to see looking at the shared rooming uh, unit concept. It's a concept that um, you know mirrors in some ways the type of housing that you're talking about, while at the same time making sure it's in the affordable rubric that will make it accessible to as many people as possible. This is a housing concept that's now catching fire on other parts of the other parts of the country, and we see that there is a demand for that kind of flexible housing if it, is, if it can be delivered in an affordable way. Uh, separate and apart from that, you know, we want to look for housing that has people invested in the equity. We want to see people be able to contribute in the way that uh, successful affordable housing cooperatives have for decades now. And so that's why we issued our shared equity RFP um, in March so that we can solicit those ideas from the larger housing think tank community, from anyone who wants to submit ideas of how we can build affordable housing and still build equity into that model in a cooperative fashion. So we're not resting on the just the, the focus on traditional construction using public funds to make sure that we build affordable housing. We're looking outside the box, looking at the housing concept that you mentioned uh, now to see if that's something we can deliver on a scalable level. Uh, we are looking at other ideas of shared equity so we can make that accessible. And of course, when it comes to the financing piece, which I'm no means an expert and we have very a very talented affordable housing finance team, and I can always come back to you and we can talk further about it. It does, it is a, you know, development is a very, um, it could be a very expensive and complex process. So we do use a mixture of both private, public, we use state, you know, state, federal, and local funds. This mayor has made a, uh, a enormous commitment of city funds to see that we can make accessible housing happen. And if there are other ways we can further evolve, we will. And so I'm happy to connect with you after to talk about what we can do in partnership. Yeah, I think lastly, is that just, uh, you know, right now there are gonna be opportunities opening up. I mean, looking at some of the empty office building or hotels that are not um, surviving and those might be the opportunity to create uh, affordable housing. But I, I just also wanna make sure that, you know, in terms of for, affordable housing, yes, family housing is important, but don't forget this single individual. That's why, you know, back in the old days, we have, you know, single room occupancy. Um, and a lot of those buildings were turned into hotels and we lost a lot of affordable housing uh, for individuals. Um, and I think that we can bring some of those back uh, as safe housing uh, for immigrants, for seniors, uh, and really seize those opportunities. Because what happened in the 80s when the city you know, economy was down, they were converting a lot of office building into residential. But unfortunately, it was not affordable. I mean, those were market rate housing and then turned into market rate co-op. And we lost that opportunity. 
And right now, when we want to seize that opportunity, we got to make sure that the housing that we create are housing for working people, uh, for low income, moderate income, and immigrant population. And let's not lose that opportunity again. Uh, so I look forward to working uh, with HPD. And I think there are so much possibility that we can do uh, to create affordable housing for the immigrant community. Thank you. Thank Great. you, Chair. Thank you, Council you. Member Chin. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask again if there are any other council members that have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no other hands, I'm going to turn it back to Chairman Chaka for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Committee Council Harbani Oja. I, um, I want to actually start with the one of the first questions that, that uh, Chair Cornegy asked uh, to Moya, to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and really just dig deeper about these federal rules and proposals, uh, the HUD rule and public charge. We did a lot of work to organize together to bring better information. Uh, we're lucky that we've landed where we are right now, but it had a lot of impact, a chilling effect. And so have you measured, I know that we talk, we talk a lot about what we're doing, but are you measuring that chilling effect uh, and, per, and as it pertains to the housing assistance programs that are currently available? Um, you're basically like giving me a flashback of the um, meeting that Sabrina and I had. Um, it is, uh, you know, measuring the chilling effect is definitely one of the top priorities for us. In fact, it is probably our number one priority in terms of our research work. But it is also, as you know, a particularly challenging um, area, you know, because of the lack of actually quantifiable data. And we actually have been, for instance, talking to some of the agencies that um, administer um, some of the agencies that administer public benefits like SNAP or housing and some of the other benefits to see if there are ways to detect sort of a trend in terms of chilling effect. And the challenges that we have seen so far is that there are so many other confounding factors, including seasonal effect, economy, et cetera. It's really hard to see that. So we are thinking, out, you know, basically a lot beyond that to see whether there are other ways that we can do that, including survey, with the clients that we encounter through our programs and or implementing a, a more specific survey that is more you know like through sampling approach but i am going to defer to sabrina who probably thinks oh god she is like she doesn't know what she's talking about um to provide more detailed and more rigorous yeah information yeah and i'd love to get some numbers uh, it sounds like you're doing surveys that's what we're trying to get to thank you um, I don't have honestly too much to add, except perhaps um, to note that like by design, a lot of our programs are designed not to ask any questions about immigration status, which I think then deliberately makes it really hard to measure, you know, if there is a chilling effect, which populations are being impacted most and why. Uh, to Jean's point, there are so many changes, particularly with a, pa a pandemic that might affect uptake of benefits. Um, but uh, to Jean's point, it is something we think about often and we work with a lot of community-based organizations and our partners just to hear anecdotally about what is happening on the ground. Um, and you know, hopefully we can get numbers, but I think it's often easier for different programs. Um, and where we have numbers, we have released them in different fact sheets like that we've done in the past, including um, around SNAP, around WIC, um, and then other surveys that we've done around the awareness of public charge in general. But I think housing in particular is really tough um, to measure as a, as a household measure, but uh, nothing further there to share at this point. Yeah, just to add to that, it is um, something that we, I, I just want to note that even though we cannot share any numbers because it has been, you know, really challenging to get sort of like exact quantification of the effect, it is something that we are constantly thinking about mm -hmm. and not just thinking about, but actually action to see what's available you know and we would love to actually collaborate with you if you have ideas or you know if you have um certain initiative in mind um we i think this is actually one of those um you know areas that's so important but also because our research team is so small meaning just us and so um having you know other partners who can really help us would be incredibly you know valuable in being able to actually do more of this so i really appreciate further discussion okay awesome thank you i i i don't um 
I, I should say I appreciate the fact that it is it is hard to measure because we're trying to be as respectful and understanding of immigrant engagement and not asking the questions is where we want to go. Um, so I appreciate that. I, I think that I, I want to see I want to see some some movement here and even some experimentation about how we can get information. And and I think what you heard from the first two um, uh, speakers on the testimony side, uh, we we heard very clearly that they also want access to to um, just funding so they can pay for rent. Uh, and and I think that we can measure it not just by saying hey. Uh, is there a chilling effect? But say, here's a service. Here's a universal basic income pilot program that can that can offer rent, um, and then see who signs up and see if we can get that that need. And and I think we can we can really offer a, a, multiple tools. But but the but the issue is resources. How do we get resources into hands of our undocumented community members that are having housing crisis issues, uh, and and there's a big plan that we can really come together around. So I think I think that's another way to to understand it, not just by the chilling, but by the access. And if Absolutely. we give access yeah. to resources, then we have something. And we're in the middle of a budget conversation too. And I think that that's where we we can really build something. And that pi a pilot, uh, and this is something that that mem members and I and others are, are thinking a lot about. And we want to put some meat to these bones. Is um, is measurable. We can measure who's coming uh, with the eligibility that we can create. Um, so, so that's just an example. That's an example. Yes, absolutely. And as you know, you know, um, we, in fact, with your um, heavy support, you know, we have done the um, cash assistance program, and I was very happy to hear that you know, Mr. Bravo actually got what I think was our funding through the you know Urban Justice Center. And I think, you know, it's something that we definitely understand that there is a continuing and in fact, even bigger need for and wanting to actually, you know, provide that continued support. It's something that, you know, we don't necessarily think of as a one time thing and we are continuing to work on and we would, uh, you know, love to be able to continue to, you know, collaborate with you and think about new ways that we can create more resources for people who are left out of the existing benefits. Great. Well, and I think that's the that's the that's the sweet spot. Um, let's move over to HPD and uh, <coughs> Deputy Commissioner Tagani. Um, has HPD noted a decrease in enrollees for any of the housing assistance programs? I'm looking for numbers here uh, over the last four years, and uh, and any analysis from those numbers about any decreases, and 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 back to the chilling effects. How how have you measured that and analyzed that? Uh, so, Chair, at this time, I don't have specific numbers. I can come back to you with it, but I will tell you that the the housing voucher program of our world, as you know, for many reasons, it's it's not something that is accessible to the New Yorkers that we're talking about. Uh, but we that is a consistent need that is. Uh, taxed on a regular basis. There is always a present need. In fact, the need is much greater than I think uh, uh, the city is in need of more affordable housing. So in the world of housing vouchers, that's a very consistent need. From the perspective of affordable housing and the uh, housing lottery, uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Deputy Commissioner Hendrickson can add, but we are constantly seeing, um, you know, huge, huge requests for uh, placement in our affordable housing, which is a clear sign to us that and keeps the pressure on us to continue to find more public sites to develop into affordable housing, more partnerships with um, the with, with holders of that housing to either preserve uh, or create new housing. Uh, the, the need is extensive, but uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Hendrickson, if you have anything like that. Yeah, uh, uh, um, good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm sorry my video doesn't work, so I do apologize. Um, Amanda, I think you said it well. Um, I, I don't want to give a number and, and be incorrect, but I think your point about in terms of the lotteries that we conduct, we always have w tremendously more people applying to the lotteries than there are units. So again, we continue to see, you know, many New Yorkers seeking affordable housing. 
many New Yorkers seeking to preserve affordable housing. And we are doing our best to try to keep up that pace of building and preserving housing. So we continue okay. to keep doing that work. Well, and, and so we, we definitely want to get those numbers. This is this is part of how we want to build either new programs mm -hmm. and be, be experimental. Uh, the budget this year is changing for the better. And, and I think this is the opportunity to really work together to figure out what can work. And as I understand it, and this is just through my, my uh, district experience in Sunset Park with affordable mm -hmm. housing lottery programs, 100% affordable programs with Fifth Avenue Committee, mm -hmm. uh, undocumented, undocumented community members can apply. And that application and that entrance is a very specific kind of entrance uh, through things like um, an ITIN number. And, and so those are ways that we can look at, see how, how are people applying? And are those increases uh, being looked at in trends across the city where, uh, especially when we can overlay uh, immigrant community population through census uh, or non-English speaking community members. And so there's, there's ways to really, this is what we're trying to get, get at uh, and, and really understand so we can build, build uh, policy and programs around that. Of course. I, I would just add, uh, just add, Chair, that it's for that reason that we've put so much emphasis, stock, and staff and resources into our Housing Ambassador Program. And we've tried to equip them and also grow that core beyond you know, the number of organizations that we have uh, throughout the boroughs, but also bringing in council offices, elected offices, any stakeholder who we can train to know these rules and provide that information because I don't, you know, I, I don't want anyone not to realize that they have a path forward. We want people applying for housing. And then on the back end, our development, our pre-planning, our public uh, site development is there to try to create more stock to get people into that affordable housing. Okay, so we'll follow up very, very shortly after this and see what we can get and, and what we can uh, ascertain and build with enough time to see if we can get something into the budget this year. This is not a budget hearing, I get it, but, but it is it is can inform some really uh, in creative policy and that budget window is closing. So let's talk about the uh, Mitchell Lama program, uh, which requires applicants to provide documentation as proof of eligibility that may act as a barrier to certain immigrant ap applicants. How has HPD and Moya collaborated to alter eligibility requirements there and open more eligibility to all immigrant New Yorkers? Uh, and, and this is also with so much praise to that 2019, uh, and I think the, hotter, the housing lottery rules that Chair Cornegie pointed to um, was great. It's, it was a great uh, opportunity. Uh, and so we're looking for, for that kind of what, what's happening there and, and are you looking at some other ways to do expansion of eligibility? I can start um, just from you know Moya's perspective. Um, it, uh, all of the, I think, in fact, the reason my position exists and I'm getting paid is because of all the barriers that you're just identifying that you know immigrants are experiencing and trying to access public benefits. And um, you know, one of the key ways, apart from just their immigration status, which we have had a lot of discussion about today, and you know, obviously, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, is, for instance, document is a lot of times incredibly you know challenging for them whether it's like proving their identity and their residence or you know their income etc and that always has been a big issue um, as well as as you know just like hes hesitance and fear in interacting with any government um, agencies and so I think part of the ways that we've been collab collaborating with HPD and the reason we really appreciate HPD's um, you know housing ambassador program and as well as housing connect program uh, uh, portal in general is that it is um, you know we have I think really successfully collaborated and sort of trying to reduce some of those barriers that you know IDNYC which is something that we you know do and make it a lot easier for immigrants who may not have all those documentations to be able to obtain their you know identity card to be able to use that to access housing connect um, or whether it's as I talked about not needing to have social security number or or even ITIN number um, to be able to still access Housing Connect if they can prove their, you know, um, income um, history in the past and, um, oh, sorry, payment history in the past and. Um, 
And um, as well as sort of always working with the community-based organizations, which I know it's something, you know, Council Chairman Chaka, you feel very passionate about, um, of like they, they are directly community to the community, uh, connected to the community members, you know, and they have their trust. And so for them to be able to actually provide assistance and, you know, giving the confidence that this is something that immigrants really should feel entitled to, that they should, you know, apply and seek assistance because, you know, it's their tax money and you know the city is providing these services so that's sort of what moyas and also we are doing um you know in collaboration with the CEOs and hpd and i will let ahmed chime in with the further discussion about yeah how we are expanding immigrant eligibility and uh, thank you and I'm, I'm going to touch on some points and i'm going to also ask my colleague who is very well versed in this topic to add but you know there well there are laws uh mitchell lamas do require new york state residency and and in the same vein others also require u.s residency for the head of the household when you're dealing with section 237 units um even in that even in that world managing agents do not uh inquire about the legal status of applicants People don't need to uh, get, uh, have, provide the green card or any type of documentation that would show uh, that they are in the country illegally. The requirement of the New York State residency can be satisfied with a driver's license, a lease, a con ed bill, credit card, etc. And it does not require documentation that a legal resident uh, uh, to show that, that residency requirement. Um, so that I think is an important note to make. And then uh, Emery, if there's anything more you'd like to add. Um, yes, thank, thanks, Councilmember, for that question. Um, and just to be clear, you know, Mitchell Llamas are not advertised through Housing Connect. Um, they, are, they have a separate kind of um, lottery process called Mitchell Llama Connect. And those lotteries are only really used when the developments need to replenish their wait list. I mean, Mitchell Llamas, you know, again, because they're so affordable and there's been so much demand, there are existing wait lists that are really in place for many of the developments. So again, we do have on our website, a list of all the Mitchell Lamas that have shorter wait lists. And of course, veterans, you know, whether they're, you know, they're immigrants, great. Um, they would go to the top of the external wait list. So that's really how Mitchell Lama operates. It's a state, you know, legislation, the legislative type of program. And there's a little bit less flexibility in that program than others. But again, because the wait lists are so long, um, typically the apartments are not really being advertised outside of using existing wait lists to get people who have been waiting many, many years um, for those apartments. Thank you for that. And it makes me think about the Home First Down Payment Program, uh, the assistance program that provides qualifying home buyers with up to $40,000 towards a down payment. We've received reports that while individuals were found eligible for the program, financial lenders were unwilling to provide the financing necessary to complete a home purchase due to the individual's immigration status. Uh, what relationship does the city have with these lenders? Relationship slash you know, power uh, to really influence and, and connect to the lenders. And then how does the city leverage these relationships to ensure that the qualifying New Yorkers aren't turned away from these third party uh, lenders and kept from purchasing a home? These, this is a game changer for so many. And it's not only possible, this is, what we, this is, this is where we wanna move. Uh, for every community that needs it, but this but today's hearing is for immigrants. So uh, again, thank you for that question, Chair. This is, uh, this, this is the first I'm hearing of this particular issue and we can certainly go back. We can, maybe we'll reach out to your office if we need more information, certainly specific cases, uh, et cetera, but um, obviously the city you know, will not tolerate uh, when the rules and regulations are followed. The participating lenders are partners, and we will look into this issue, and we'll certainly get uh, all the information and come back to you. And if there's if there are people who should be eligible and should have an opportunity to this program, we want to make sure that they have that opportunity. I just think we're going to need a little bit more information, sir. Okay. Happy to, and um, and I don't know if any if if this is something on Moya's radar, at all. Ha, has has this come in through in the hotline? Um, have you have you seen it percolate as an issue? Um, from our outreach organizers, we have heard um, 
I think generally, usually, as you know, you know, uh, vast majority of immigrants are um, renting their place rather than owning or trying to own. So most of the story we hear is relating to um, their, you know, application to the landlord and having trouble, um, for instance, because they don't have social security numbers. But um, what even relating to mortgage, I, our understanding is that, you know, that is something that, um, although I don't know whether I know of this specific instance, I will have to go back to the outreach team. But I, you know, we, I'm very closely in touch with them. And um, what we generally hear, and, you know, we think is, again, a huge problem, and we uh, are, have been doing a lot of, that's why I know your rights, uh, our program is very important, but um, we're hoping to do more work on in collaboration with you is the fact that a lot of times, um, whether it's landlords or employers or, you know, people who are getting mortgage brokers or whoever, there is this misconceived notion that social security number is required everywhere when that is not necessarily the case. And also when you don't have that, you know, part, having suddenly have to, um, go through barriers that other people don't, which is definitely, you know, a violation of the city human rights law as well as the state human rights law. And so that's sort of are the general issues we are definitely aware of. And it's something that we're um, paying a lot of attention to. What doing. power does the city have over these lenders? Like, can, can you regulate here? Can you, can you really kind of come in and say, this is not okay and, uh, what kind of power does the city have? Do we know? So, uh, so again, these are participating lenders who are, these are specific lenders who we say uh, are allowed to be part of this program. So if there, if there are violations or if there are issues, we would look at that, whether or not they should remain in, in the program. I think it's important to say that right now the program is designed a as a point of accessibility with partners who understand and share the same vision and goal that we do it's a mix of uh institutions of different sizes and kinds and for it's specifically built to make sure that there's a variety and give people the option and accessibility they need however again uh after looking and understanding more about the situation we can see what happens in since We'll look at it more globally, of course, and we work with our partners in Moya, where all of these programs go through a thorough, you know, vetting to make sure that they are in compliance with all the appropriate regulations, federal, state, local, and especially when it comes to access and protecting people's rights. It's something we take very seriously. And again, because we are saying that there, 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 there are teams that are participating, people who could be part of this program, uh, folks will need to have to be within the bounds of what's allowed. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring that and, and really using the muscle of the city to make that, make that happen. Uh, it might just be ignorance and it just requires maybe a conversation. And so I, wanna, I want that to change. And so let's do that together. Uh, let's go back to the, the hotline and the hotline that's gotten a lot of requests for a whole bunch of things. We've been mentioning it over this conversation. Uh, and, and, and Director Bay, I would like to kind of hear from you about the primary, primary requests um, that are coming in relating to housing. Uh, if you have numbers on referrals that are made uh, for HRA administered housing assistance, for example, um, HPD administered housing, we, I wanna get a sense of, of what is coming into the hotline and uh, what kind of types of housing assistance are being asked for or connected to. Yeah, definitely. Um, probably our uh, community service team director, Eileen, is right now like, see, I told you I needed to get this number. And so I actually have it in front of me. Um, oh. And <laughs> so we have, um, so we have, uh, um, so we have received around um, 70 uh, referrals in last year, 2020, that really is 70 inquiries relating to housing or tenant protection or anything relating to that. And then this year, I think this again shows the you know, gravity of issues just becoming more similar, but we have received 74 inquiries so far. And given that 2021, you know, only has been like we just had first quarter, it just shows, you know, inquiry is in increasing. And sort of questions usually, um, you know, people may not necessarily directly know the resources themselves, as you know. So a lot of times there are questions relate to, um, 
you know, for instance, is there rental arrears and public assistance and um, things like that they're looking for, which is, um, you know, probably one of the more prominent questions that we get or um, concern about the landlord legal assistance. So a lot of times for that, we either refer them to um, home based program or a fasten program, depending on their eligibility, as well as um, um, some of the um, other sort of um, cash assistance programs if they're eligible. And then, uh, and legal assistance, you know, HRA OCJ implements that. And, you know, uh, thanks to in fact, council's hard work, we have a universal housing legal assistance law. So under that, you know, they can get assistance. And so we refer to them on that as well. I think that's about, I would say, two thirds, if not more of, um, you know, the calls that we receive sort of go through that route. And then sort of the rest is basically more specifically looking for um, actual housing, um, you know, like uh, access to the more uh, secure housing, which is um, actually, you know, about 10 or so, like, so it's not as many, um, but um, still it's um, you know, a significant number. And for that, a lot of times, because we have a specifically trained staff members who can actually handle um, sort of like knowing all the specificity of these you know different housing programs that um i don't pretend to be an expert of and so we um and they run the tenant helpline which also our outreach team and communications team have been helping and supporting and so we usually refer to them so the specialists can you know specifically go through the scenarios and provide the appropriate assistance and just so we can be clear about about this we're talking about a tenant hotline versus yes. just like a action nyc hotline yeah that's the hotline that we refer to but the numbers that i was talking about was of the moya hotline which is people directly calling us saying they need help from us yes. got it got it and that's a citywide hotline as well yeah tenant helpline is a citywide helpline and um it's managed by mayor's office to protect tenants and they handle all these um, issues, including, you know, uh, also like they provide, for instance, assistance to fill out the hardship declaration to be protected mm. under the eviction moratorium and things like that. So they handle a comprehensive range of different services that people need relating to housing. Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. I have some follow ups, but we can talk offline on, on that. Uh, moving on to really thinking about how Moya conducts outreach, uh, really specifically to housing resources and assistance how do you how do you target specific communities how how do you know where to target and what do you do to target those communities um you know, actually, one of the things that Sabrina and I have been um, doing a lot of thinking around lately is how and we always have been aware, but um, how immigrants are not a monolithic entity, which is, I think, sort of what you're referring to that, you know, yeah. within immigrant communities, obviously, you know, there's always um, like income disparity, even when we talk about, for instance, specific like Asian immigrants, you know, being me being part of it, um, or like Black immigrants, et cetera, like even within them, there is a huge disparity as to like their income, education, what kind of jobs they have. And as we know, New York City, a lot of times, they live in different neighborhoods sort of like congregated and that also depending on the housing stocks in those neighborhoods that can obviously create um, very unique housing issues that might be different from others their culture obviously has impact on that as well so in terms of working with the outreach team I mean while we fully understand uh, you know we are we take our responsibility under the city law to not discriminate against anyone based in providing programs to uh, based on their national origin or you know immigration status very seriously we also fully you know uh, agree with you and and and, and take import uh, think it's very important that we need to know the specific needs of different communities and target them and so actually for that um I think there are a couple of ways that we do it, which is that most of our presentations that outreach team conducts and doing done in language, and this is thanks to their amazing capacity of being able to speak many languages. And you know, in that process, and also they're constantly talking to different community leaders. And for instance, this is how we found that, for instance, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, sort of more, uh, much more heightened need uh, 
relating to overcrowding, um, which also council member Drum is very well aware of certain South Asian communities. And that was where we did very you know, targeted proactive outreach on the availability of COVID-19 hotel program and sort of the importance of social distancing. And so relate, even relating to housing, if there's like, you know, uh, for instance, if we see more of um, uh, not direct lease and just you are very well aware a lot of times immigrants may have sublease of a sublease or may there may not be any lease and so and that's prominent in certain communities over others and so in those cases particularly highlighting when we're uh, highlighting when we're doing presentation that you know um, that that doesn't mean that you don't have rights um, you know in fact you still have a right as a tenant um, to not be evicted um, without the you know due process um, procedure and so those are some of the ways that we are um you know trying to do more of a um a, like making sure that we address specific needs of the communities but um you know we would further like to collaborate with you on i know that this is, issue is very important to you you know we have heard through your council staff that this is something that you are really caring about and that's something that we also would like to do more work on so well and 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 part of what we want to get from this hearing and some follow up from this hearing is is just data raw data about numbers um funding how time like there, there's a lot of ways we can measure the focus and outreach geography uh there's there's analysis here that i think could help us at the council as the policy making machine to really offer you all some ideas uh, but without numbers it's it's gonna it's it's hard and it's not impossible because I, you know, we have relationships, so we can we can through anecdotal um, response we can do that. We we want to dig deeper with numbers. We want to really understand what what's happening now, where is it happening, how is it happening, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And and so maybe this next question can can get to that, um, and really in partnership from Moya with other agencies, how do you educate housing inspectors? on the experiences of immigrant New Yorkers because they're not a monolith. They're very different. Um, language, all of these pieces. How do, you, how do you educate them and specifically tenant harassment and immigration enforcement to ensure that there's a positive and sensitive interaction between uh, the inquilino and the city person? Um, yes, um, just Relating to the data piece, it's something that again, Sabrina and I are working on. It's like, you must have like secretly like logged into my computer and looked at our research agenda priorities or something. Um, we are trying to figure out how we can sort of be more sensitive to that diverse, you know, nature of immigrant communities. And, you know, some of the things that we are thinking about um, are, you know, going more specific to that. Obviously the challenge is doing it in a sensitive way that it doesn't stigmatize any specific communities. And so it's something that we are still in a very, like an early stage of working on and, you know, would definitely love to collaborate with you and, you know, get more input. Um, relating to how we work with, um, we, as a Moya, I'm being fully honest, I don't think we directly work with housing inspectors, but having said it, when we are working with the agency, I mean, I could be totally wrong, you know, like I, if you, somebody might come back to me and say that I'm not doing it. Um, yeah, I, I misrepresented, um, but just in terms of working with other agencies, I know for a fact that, and I probably am wrong now that I think about it, because we do work with other agencies to routinely provide um, training on sort of like, you know, immigration, um, immigrant specific fear and concern and their needs, by which I mean, for instance, how public charge rule has affected them or whether it's relating to immigration enforcement and their concern about when somebody knocking on the door and, you know, how that affects them and things like that. And, you know, we have also, um, we have also done, um, uh, our know your rights training to immigrant communities directly so that they are also aware of their rights in those kind of situations, which are a lot of times, um, you know, uh, being, I just know, you know, being undocumented immigrants, particularly in this community, uh, in this city, a lot of times make you think that um, you don't necessarily have any rights and that you um, may not, you know, uh, you may not necessarily be able to, uh, you know, ask for things or challenge things. 
things or ask for a lawyer and things like that. And so um, for, uh, for us to reach to communities and providing that information is really important. And, and also working with our different city agencies is which important. To be honest, that's actually how I learned about Moya when I was at Department of Health because you know Moya came to Department of Health and have done a lot of collaboration, a lot of presentations. So, um, you know, yeah. And with that, I'm going to uh, uh, defer to HPD to see if they have anything to add. Uh, thank you. Our uh our in-field workforce, inspectors or otherwise, are always uh, given the the understanding that they represent the face of the agency. They are uh, they are our ambassadors in the world. Um, as part of their training, these are topics that are are woven into how they develop their approach and understanding of how to carry the job day in day out. Um, there's always new information that we again gather and learn from collaborations either uh, with Moya or from case study in the field. Uh, when it comes to emergencies, that responsibility and that understanding becomes even more important. We have uh, language access and um, language, uh, language assistant staff who are part of emergency situations when it's called for and we need that cultural competency, competency in the field. So both from a training perspective and also from a resource allocation and deployment perspective, we are looking at this question uh, in normal day-to-day -day housing enforcement, housing maintenance code uh, issues that we look into and also in response to emergencies. You know, it's in order for us to get to the root problem of what happens, people normally have to communicate to us things that are happening that are not easy to see inside an apartment leaks behind a wall, issues in the neighbor's apartment. And so being able to navigate those hurdles that come from not being aware of the, of, of being culturally aware of how to navigate uh, these conversations puts us at a disadvantage, which is why it's worth our time and resources to put uh, training in that regard. Uh, Anne-Marie, do you have anything that uh, I'm missing here? No, I'm a, I don't. I think you said it well. Okay, well, 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 thank you for that. I, I, I want to follow up with that too. That that um, that's an area of opportunity here to to be uh, not just sensitive, but to to be held accountable at the city level. That that this is this is a fresh uh, training. That it's that it's up to date. That an inspector will understand that there's a public charge rule. As soon as it changes, that that may come up. That they're ready. Um, you know, they are the face. We are all the face of the city in some ways, and that interaction will rise up with issues if you even get to the point where you're you're, you're engaging uh, and talking. Um, and so, um, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I want to move through, um, and I'm just thinking about the, the kind of multiple issues that have happened in the Im immigrant community, and very most recently, the sustained rise in anti-Asian discrimination and harassment permeating New York City uh, now for more over than a year now. Um, what sensitivity trainings have been required of city employees who regularly interface with members of the public? Uh, I'm going to go back to the housing inspectors because I think that's a, that's what we're trying to understand. But has anyone gotten new training, different training, better training around this issue? Sorry. Uh, so, Chair, you know, once again, I want to uh, I want to repeat what our state our comments and our statements. You know, that kind of uh, that kind of action is unacceptable. We moved quickly to address the situation. And we made sure to reiterate to our staff, regardless of their inspector, any employee at the HPD, what the standard is and our responsibilities as stewards of that standard uh, in the city. Um, we will continue to look for ways to get that me message even further ingrained in our work uh, as an agency, um, and especially an agency who's for the last two years, over 150 meetings, has worked to, to develop a robust fair housing plan around building more equity in the way we create housing and allow people to move and grow uh, in the housing network in New York. We are, we are constantly thinking of strategies outside and inside. So it requires uh, internally, our staff has gone through extensive 
cultural awareness and recognition and equity training uh, as part of that process. And that is something that out of that process came out ideas of how we can better, better instill that in our, our inspector training and in our staff training to be better stewards of that standard. So I think what I heard was that, uh, and I'll just repeat it back to you that that is unacceptable across the board. You have a standard of excellence and, and you're gonna meet it. What I'm asking for is any additional new uh, since, since we've been all been seeing the, the rise in anti-Asian sentiment throughout the city. And that's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for like what you already do uh, yeah. that we're gonna hold you accountable to that excellence, but is there anything new that you've done? Uh, and, and I know recently there was some, some stuff in the press about a housing inspector, but is there anything new? That's what I'm asking um, about. I, I can come back to you about any new trainings or any adjustments or revisions to that training. Uh, we have, I, you know, I can tell you that we have started by making sure that is the priority of management and supervisors to spend time to address this issue and make sure people understand that standard. But if you, for other kinds of specifics, technical changes or updates to material, I can come back to you for answer. Please, uh, thank you, shortly, because we really want to get a sense and, and stay on top of that for, for every reason that, that I think we're trying to figure out here. Uh, and especially through this committee specifically, we're really interested in elevating this issue through a public hearing conversation and, and ensuring that, that we can really hold the city accountable to, to um, addressing that. And that we think is, that space is, is a training space that's new and very specific and is done. And not just like referring to, well, this is not who we are. It, it's clearly not working. Let's make it better. Um, so let's talk about Let's move over to the federal stimulus. Uh, I know as a BNT member, a budget negotiation team member, we're all looking at this and figuring out where's it gonna go? Uh, and we're in the middle of that negotiation, but very specifically, um, how is that money being used to ensure, as far as you know, both Moya and HPD, to ensure that immigrant New Yorkers have equal access to affordable housing? Are city, um, city testing and vaccine sites, uh, for example, screening housing, uh, you know, and, and this is something that I'm, I'm personally working on right now, we're gonna be interacting with, if we get it right, and I, I am hoping we do, that's the goal to get 90 plus percent vaccination. We're gonna be seeing people go through a city government experience like a vaccine. And if we're not throwing everything at it, uh, like how, what's going on with housing and food stamps? Can we re-enroll you? This is an opportunity to really engage someone that is now coming out and saying yes. And I'm talking about the immigrant community who we're already going to have trouble. That last 25% is going to be the hardest as we get to vaccination. This is an opportunity to engage in a very positive way. And already, you know, that's so, someone coming in already worked on uh, with trust. And maybe it's a local council member. It's a local uh, uh, nonprofit, uh, they will have some kernel of trust to get into that room, perfect opportunity to throw this in. So are we, are we thinking about stimulus money for this? Uh, and can we work together? Because I have some ideas on how to really draw that for, for not just vaccine equity, but services equity. I can start with a couple of things. And um, you know, I think, um, where you're thinking is exactly where Moya is thinking. And in fact, we have been you know, uh, working really closely with the Vaccine Command Center of the City Hall and sort of advocating for that you know, importance of engaging community um, leaders like you and like you know, nonprofits, et cetera, um, for them to be actually, uh, to make sure that you know, we gain their trust and also help them um, gain access to getting um, needed services. So for instance, for uh, especially vaccine. So with vaccine actually relating to federal funding, um, you know, our um, all, uh, city has been working with a lot of community-based organizations who are part of the test and trace, you know, CBO group that are um, providing assistance to, um, you know, uh, New York City residents, including many immigrant communities. In fact, many of them are organizations that you're very familiar with that work with um, immigrants and undocumented immigrants. And, um, you know, that was something that was uh, partly, uh, you know, possible because of, you um, ability to utilize um, federal funding. And, you know, the fact that again, you know, as you know, some of the, when it comes to sort of more indirect access um, 
assistance, it becomes a little easier to um, rely on federal funding. And so that was, you know, some of the ways that we have been working on. And in terms of the housing, you know, uh, you may have uh, probably <laughs> But you know, uh, federal stimulus uh, included the emergency rental assistance funding that originally, you know, state government um, implemented like twice with the applications period being open twice. But um, I think for a number of reasons, just being perfectly honest in terms of the exact barriers that we have talked about, including immigration status and documentation and just the challenges that people had, I think um, it still you know, could use more outreach and more assistance to be able to fully allocate that funding, which was why the city stepped in. And you know, now we have an RFP available for community-based organizations to be able to provide provide um, you know, sort of assistance to the community members directly so that they can access this fund, which they obviously, as we know, really need given the um, sort of um, rental crisis that we have in this city right now. And so those are sort of the two big ways that I can think of and you know, everything pretty much all of the Moya program, partly because, you know, we are not necessarily a huge agency, but also partly because we um, really, really highly value our partnership with the community-based organizations. So all of the programs that we lead or we have had a very significant role on like FASTEN, um, you know, is done through CEOs. And I think HPD also is on the same, you know, uh, sort of wavelength as well on that, which was why that program um, worked out that way. And so that's, I think, how we really try to make sure that, you know, we can um, uh, sort of meet immigrants where, they, where they're there. And by the way, I'm quoting you in your, I think, hearing like three times, <laughs> three hearings ago or something. I wasn't lying when I said I was here, um, you know, all the time. And so I think um, that's sort of, yeah, the approach that we've been taking together. And I'll let Ahmed talk more with the, um, any other additional housing assistance related, yeah, comments that he has. Yeah, I thank you. I, I think you you said it well. We all, all our partners on the ground, whether it's for proactive, uh, pro proactive inspections, or any of our uh, other organizations that we run around tenant harassment, uh, where we work with groups, we are also talking to those groups about what other wraparound services they're providing, whether or not it's something that we can be involved and support, and if if needed and many of them are very savvy and astute and don't need this assistance but from time to time they will need help bridging connections to other city agencies that's what we're here to do as you know behind the scenes we are constantly as a government meeting together to make sure how we are leveraging every opportunity piggybacking off each other each other's events we are using our shared social media and communication platforms to talk about these things like making sure that new yorkers get vaccinated uh regardless of what the issue topic is because we know that at any point, as I said earlier, people are living you know, tremendously difficult lives. They're navigating a lot of things. So if you have an opportunity to capture their attention, that's when you need to get the, the word out. I also just wanted to back, um, take a step back and affirmatively say that the tr uh, on your question about trainings, they are being refreshed due to the, uh, the, the, the situation that's going on, the things that are happening so that we make sure um, those lessons, especially for our inspectors, are uh, are there and present and ingrained, and of course we'll continue to come back with you, come back to you with more specifics. But want you to know that affirmatively, trainings are being refreshed. That's great to hear. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. And and I think what what I wanted, I just want to say, and this is my final question, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from the the advocates and maybe even really kind of hearing from them, and and um, not just on the approach, ideas, and what happening right now but in response to what they heard from you all today and and if there are any gaps in that experience that we find those gaps and, and fix them but I know that uh, just through my that my work in the last year this is something I'm talking to the team about uh, there are a lot of separate separate from the um, the assistance that we're getting directly from the city that the mayor will have the, the opportunity to propose spending uh, and the council will have to approve that spending through our budget negotiations, there are separate pots of money uh, inter, uh, or nationally through, uh, there's national money coming from the federal government to help cities fight vaccine equity. And I think that if, are, is Moya connected to those conversations in drawing some of that money through the Department of Health? And I'd like to get in on that conversation to really help think through this. Language access is everything 
uh, to, uh, to vaccine equity. And I think this committee has the opportunity to really inform those, those applications, especially when we're talking about like 20 plus billion dollars that are going nationally. Uh, I wanna be able to influence that. And, and can, can we do that? Um, so I, I, um, so there are multiple things that I can uh, refer to. One is that you know there has been a um, RFP that was issued by the federal government that was sort of seeking you know vaccine equity um, outreach That's work, it. and uh, uh, we have been in touch with um, Department of Health. I think my understanding is they you know have submitted their own application and and sort of making sure that that is you know like, and the thing about the OHMH and. You know, I'm. I came from right. there. Is right. that we have very close relationships, so they fully understand, particularly the people that I work with, the importance of sort of, um, you know, like like addressing certain very immigrant specific issues and designing program. And so that's something that's very much on their mind. And um, and I think sort of in terms of the work, yeah. And so the work that's doing with the CBOs and relating to the federal fundings, we do work, uh, we work from Moya's perspective, we work in both ways. One is working with the agencies to um, make sure that we can influence the way that they are um, doing their operation. You know, it's not just about in fact, you know, outreach to uh, communities that are being left out right now, but it's, uh, you know, beyond that in terms of access, like, you know, yeah. what are the things that we see that are not being addressed on sites? Um, so whether it's language access <laughs> issues or whether it's the fact that on FEMA site, we have military people standing outside or that, you know, uh, you know, uh, or the documentation issues, although it's now less of a burden when, you know, people have to uh, show their employment status, the challenges they had. And so, you know, from there, there have, we have had a very collaborative relationship trying to come up with alternatives that we could negotiate with the state to be able to you know utilize whether it's for instance for day laborers or some of the other people who you know delivery workers and other people who may have really challenging time finding an employer or getting an employer's letter um, you know because of their immigration status like can a nonprofit who work with them can you know basically attest to their um, employment status and things like that so that's the work that we continue do and will be doing, especially as they're now thinking about sort of, you know, uh, with the bigger funding, federal funding coming in, thinking about sort of more proactive outreach and the work they're doing. And, and then the other part is uh, sort of really, you know, again, uh, knowing that community-based organizations are the voice of the communities, like making sure that they're plugged into the dialogue that's happening at a high level with whether it's other government agencies or right. even with the federal, you know, um, government agencies like CDCs, you know, for them to have an opportunity to actually have a direct discussion so we always you know recommend the uh, organizations we always you know like um, try to uh, provide the information about such opportunities so that you know they can really raise the voice about what's going on on the ground because you know I'm talking to you about this issue now but I also fully fully admit that I'm just right now sitting in my home and may not necessarily understand what's going on on each of the sites or each of the communities that our organizers are you know door knocking on or providing a flyer on so those are some of the approaches that we are taking and uh sort of uh yeah relating to more specific housing part um i would defer to um hp sorry ahmed i feel like i keep like just saying <laughs> no no this is this is the work that we enjoy and we're excited to do we're excited to work with with our partners on the ground to do this. And uh, you know, with the federal stimulus money with regards to outreach and working with partners in the Department of Health is we are you know, working with, with both the Department of Health, we're working with the VEX uh, Command Center to figure out ways how through us, information about how to get people details regarding opportunities to get vaccinated, flexibility and the, the flexibility and the options to be eligible and to and this gets back to a core issue that you mentioned at the beginning, there, is, uh, there was an inherent fear and distrust. If this is a government program, 
people are feeling cagey or off put. And so we're trying to break down those barriers by working with the CBOs on the ground. And there is no city agency at this point that doesn't have a responsibility in getting the word out about vaccinations. Whatever our primary goal and primary mission, that's one. Number two, we're all vaccination hub ambassadors. So our communications team is working hard at figuring out how we weave that into the, the various newsletters that go out. Our folks on the ground are talking to the CBOs uh, that we work with. Again, a large portion of those relationships come from you know, the, the, the amazing contribution the council does every year in discretionary funds, 11 million, 80 CBOs alone uh, in, in, that, in that group funding their work helping them go further and reaching out to people. We will bring to the table whatever government resources we can uh, so that they can do that work, information, bringing them at the higher level of the conversation. So again, I see uh, primary, we're doing the mission of HPD, but we're all vaccination ambassadors right now. Okay, well, I, I wanna follow up and, and maybe specifically with you, Director Bay, specifically on the DOH work and, and the city coming up with a, a ultimate plan. I. I want to uh, believe that they understand, uh, but to your point, I think there's always an opportunity for us to help shape what that looks like. And I and I have some very specific ideas that are coming from the community that uh, we can we can kind of build into it. Since there's a lot, of, I mean, the, the federal government is throwing money at us as in the country to solve the equity issue for the vaccine that can really help us build platforms for and, and infrastructure for the future, future vaccine need, and also all this other stuff that the city needs to get done. So that's that's how I'm coming in on, on it. And we're gonna be hearing from the advocates next. Thank you so much for your patience uh, to all the organizations that are testifying and people in the public. Um, and I just wanna get a, a confirmation from both of you that you will have somebody on this call. Uh, you know, my preference, but not required is that they are on camera, but if not, I just want to know who who's going to stay if it's not you for the rest of the testimony. So I wasn't kidding when I said I was at most of your hearings all the time <laughs> from the beginning till the end. So I'm going to stay as much as possible. I don't know how much longer it'll go, um, okay. but um, definitely, you know, I'll be here at least until two o'clock, I believe. And then we have... Yeah. Um, um, uh, our uh, two fellows, Daphne and uh, Marco, who have been diligently sort of, you know, I think sending notes to different people um, will be definitely on and continuing to, yeah, monitor there. You're not gonna be seeing their name because they didn't necessarily get Zoom links. So they're watching it through live stream, but they will, yeah, they will definitely be there. And, you know, I will be there as long as possible. Okay. And Sergeant of Arms, if, if we need to bring them on um, so that they can take notes uh, as an official capacity, I'll recommend that, but I don't know how that will work. Uh, and then HPD, what, what, um, what's so your So I'll, I'll be continuing to, to listen and say I won't be on camera. Uh, and also I'll be joined by, and I am joined now by Jordan Gibbons with, from our Office of Intergovernmental Affairs who will be here for the duration of the hearing as well. Well, beautiful. Thank you so much for your time this morning, uh, now and afternoon. And I'll hand it back to our committee council, Harbani Oja. Thank you so much, Chair. I'm just confirming that there are no other questions from council members at this time. Seeing no hands, I'm going to thank this panel for their testimony. Um, at this time, we have concluded administration testimony and we'll be moving on to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I would like to now welcome our first public panel to testify. In order, I will be calling on Aura Meja, followed by Trisha Sobha, followed by Sheena Kang, followed by Yamilka Menya, followed by Leslie Ann Carabello, followed by Alexandra Doherty, followed by Alma Arias. Aura Meja, you may begin when you are ready. 
Time begins. Aura, we can't hear you. You have to accept the unmute. Looks like she did accept it. Oh, there we go. Let's try it again. Ahora no se escucha. Okay, we will circle back to you. Um, uh, I'm going to now call on Trisha Sopa. You may begin when you are ready. Clock's ready. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Chaka and Chair Carnegie and the Committees on Immigration and Housing and Buildings for holding this hearing on this important issue. My name is Trisha Sopa. And I am a staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice, where we provide legal assistance to low income New Yorkers in a wide range of areas, including in immigration and housing matters. I would like to address today why DRE should be expanded to include immigrant New Yorkers who are currently excluded. DRE allows people with disabilities to remain in their home and communities with dignity. DRE greatly minimizes the risk of people with disabilities becoming homeless or unnecessarily institutionalized in hospitals or nursing homes. To be eligible for DRE, the applicant is required to prove their disability through receiving a federally funded disability income program. As mentioned today, due to immigration status, certain immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, are, are ineligible for these forms of disability payments and therefore cannot qualify for DRE only because of their immigration status. Providing no other alternatives to prove their disability is not only unacceptable, but also discrimination based on immigration status. Expanding DRE to immigrant New Yorkers, many who have been the hardest hit by COVID-19 in New York is more important now than ever. Many have lost their jobs or are subject to discrimination and unfair wages because of their immigration status. Therefore, having to pay increasing rent has become even more difficult for them. This will undoubtedly lead to homelessness and placement in the shelter system or unnecessarily institutionalization in facilities like nursing homes that have been plagued by COVID-19 over the past year. It is time to expand DRE to immigrant New Yorkers who are currently excluded. It is time to stop the unfair and undeniable discrimination based on someone's immigration status. Expanding DRE to immigrant New Yorkers would allow them to stay in their homes and would also be saving New York City money by avoiding an increase in placement in the shelter system, hospitals, or nursing homes. I believe legislative fixes are possible and that there are solutions where immigrants can be included and heard. By taking the necessary steps to include immigrants in DRE, where we would, be, we would be on the way to ensuring that no New Yorker is left behind and that they receive the benefits they qualify for regardless of their immigration status. I would like to thank Senator Rivera and Assembly Member Gonzalez Rojas for their leadership on this very important issue. I would also like to thank Council Member Drum for his leadership in the New York City Council on this issue. Thank you all for your time and for allowing me to testify today on behalf of the community. I am so honored to serve every day. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Sheena Kang to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Clock is ready. Good morning. My name is Sheena Kong. Uh, thank you, Chair Menchaca and Chair Carnegie and the committees for holding this hearing, and thank you for allowing me to testify today. I am a Senior Policy Analyst at Citizens Housing and Planning Council, or CHPC. CHPC is a nonprofit research and education organization focused on improving housing policy and planning in New York City to improve the lives of all New Yorkers. CHPC is in full support of the pre-considered resolution and we thank Council Member John for bringing it forward. Countless barriers in the workforce and housing market make it more difficult for foreign born New Yorkers to find and maintain high quality housing that they can afford. Obstacles like these tend to be even greater for residents whose immigration status precludes them from qualifying for federal aid. 
For example, the median earnings of undocumented New Yorkers in 2018 was only $29,000 compared to $49,000 for US born workers. On top of these issues, over 200,000 New Yorkers face the additional challenges of working and maintaining housing and living with a disability. So excluding these especially vulnerable individuals from DRE limits the program's impacts and also runs counter to its goals. It hurts not only disabled immigrant New Yorkers who would otherwise qualify for the program, but also their children and dependents. Over one in eight New Yorkers lives in a mixed status household, including 260,000 children who are overwhelmingly US born citizens themselves. Too often as policymakers and planners, we overlook the fact that 38% of residents and 44% of workers in New York City are foreign born. And when our policies fail to consider the unique needs and challenges that these New Yorkers face, we both reinforce inequality and risk detrimental losses for the city overall. Immigration has always been a key driving force of our population and economic growth. So now more than ever, as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to ensure that New York remains an attractive place for new immigrants and a place where all um, immigrants have ample opportunities to succeed. I'd like to share with you that last year, CHPC released a report entitled Housing Plan for a City of Immigrants to explore the ways that housing policy can help meet these goals. In line with the pre-considered resolution today, the report recommends expanding access to crucial public benefits, such as emergency rental assistance to households of all immigration statuses. And many of the other solutions we propose resonate with some of the other really important issues that were brought up today, such as eliminating barriers for immigrant households to the city's affordable housing lotteries and creating a regulatory framework for the development of safe and high quality SROs. So we hope that you'll find this paper and CHPC in general as a resource in this discussion. And we look forward to working with you on these issues moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Yamilka Mena to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Good afternoon. My name okay. is Jamilka Mena, and I'm the Director of Immigration Initiatives at the Hispanic Federation, the nation's premier Latino nonprofit membership organization. I would like to thank Chairman Chaka, Carnegie, and all the committee members for bringing us together to discuss the housing disparities that immigrant New Yorkers continue to face. I'm going to cut down my testimony so that I won't repeat what has already been said um, with regard to the impact on the pandemic that has, that has been had on immigrants and housing disparities. I think Mr. Bravo, Mr. Cortez, and my colleagues on this panel have done a great job on summarizing um, the issues and the data. What we want to talk about is sustainability. We know that the disproportionate impact on immigrants, especially undocumented immigrants, is far-reaching as has intersected all areas such as health, economy, education, and importantly, housing. These issues have been perpetuated more during the pandemic where immigrant communities who make up a lot of the essential workforce have been left out of federal aid. With the passage of the Excluded Workers Fund, we can see that there is capacity to support the undocumented community. However, we know that although a huge win, the fund is not sustainable. Expanding DRE and creating a similar eligibility model as a SCREE program can be a great step toward ensuring the undocumented disabled immigrant community has access to important benefits that will keep them in their homes especially during these unprecedented times. New York City has to acknowledge and address the inequities of the COVID-19 response toward immigrants by first adopting this um, pre-considered resolution to expand access to DRE, uh, including immigrant, undocumented immigrants, expanding the commitment of the city funding toward emergency cash assistance programs to continue addressing the unprecedented economic challenges still faced by immigrant New Yorkers, particularly with rent assistance, emphasizing the distribution of multilingual community updates pertaining to the ever-changing status of eviction protections and current NYC tenant rights, and finally supporting continued expansion of food pantries, all city feeding programs, and increasing food allowances for emergency housing programs. Thank you for your time. The Hispanic Federation is committed to working with the New York City Council and colleagues to continue to protect immigrant New Yorkers during the COVID-19 pandemic and towards an equitable recovery. 
Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Leslie Ann Carabello to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Clock is ready. Thank you, council members, for holding this hearing today and for affording me an opportunity to speak. My name is Leslie Ann Caraballo. Uh, I am proud to represent the Legal Aid Society, where I'm a practicing law graduate with the civil housing practice. I will submit written testimony, which I hope the council members will read after this hearing, but I will briefly address some points now. The Legal Aid Society was founded in 1876 to provide legal assistance to low-income German immigrants. Our client base quickly expanded to a diverse clientele of New Yorkers hailing from 37 countries. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, for 145 years, we have remained true to that legacy as tireless advocates for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Yet despite our best efforts, the, the housing disparity remains. It is our undocumented neighbors that today bear the brunt of this lasting inequity. As was discussed earlier, although documented New Yorkers are significant contributors to the city economy, they have significantly lower earnings uh, than U.S. born New Yorkers, and yet they carry a higher rent burden and face higher, um, substantially higher overcrowding rates. They also face unique barriers in finding and keeping homes. Undocumented clients are often constrained by apartment applications, which was mentioned uh, by Moya earlier, um, in that they require specific forms of ID, including social security numbers. They may lack credit history and are awful, often unable to provide proof of income due to informal employment arrangements. This makes undocumented tenants more vulnerable to unscrupulous landlords and neighbors who may exploit their circumstances and threaten to call ICE. Um, as such, they often are afraid to seek assistance from authorities when experiencing substandard living conditions. But by far the biggest barrier uh, to bridging the housing gap for undocumented New Yorkers is the lack of government assistance. They are largely ineligible for means-tested housing programs and rules wholly exclude entirely undocumented families and can render unaffordable otherwise uh, affordable housing for families with mixed immigration status. We know that undocumented New Yorkers were disproportionately affected by the pandemic um, and that immigrant workers were more susceptible to job loss due to pandemic closures, yet they are un ineligible for unemployment benefits and were largely ex excluded from federal uh, stimulus relief. Many of our clients are enmeshed in uh, non-payment cases due to a loss of income as a result of the pandemic. These are our most difficult cases as there are few, if any, options for addressing high rent arrears accrued during the pandemic. Applicants must show proof of income and a future ability to pay ongoing rent um, to receive a one-shot deal from HRA. Undocumented clients are often unable to provide such documentation due to the informal nature of their employment. One of my clients, Mr. X, I'll call him, applied several times for a one shot, but was repeatedly denied. HRA told him that he would otherwise be approved if he could just show his proof of income. Unfortunately, his employer refused to write the letter due to the informal nature of his work. Uh, Mr. X is a single dad with a daughter. Another um, client, uh, I respectfully just ask for one minute to conclude. Uh, another client is a restaurant worker only working about one day a week. And yet another client is a house cleaner and people have stopped utilizing services. She has two children at home. None of these clients uh, are eligible for one shots. The only lifeline that has been available to them is the FASTEN grant. Uh, while we are heartened that the new emergency rental assistance programs will be available to undocumented individuals, we strongly encourage prompt and efficient administration of these resources with a particular emphasis on outreach and accessibility, um, language barriers, lack of, lack of access to technology, are uh, significant obstacles in our work and for our clients and have been particularly challenging during this pandemic. Um, while we look forward to this rent release, we have to acknowledge that we need, uh, desperately need solid city and state funded mechanisms. <clears throat> Excuse me. We support um, council member John's resolution calling on the state legislature to pass uh, uh, the GRE eligibility expansion. Um, and we also uh, support a uh, initiatives like the Housing Access Voucher Program, championed by uh, State Senator Brian Kavanaugh. Um, and, and New York deems itself a sanctuary city. We acknowledge a right to housing, but we are doing little in a way of refuge for most of our vulnerable contributors to our society. And we have to ask how much longer shall these essential community members wait? How much more shall they endure before they are recognized for their contributions and offered an opportunity to attain a stable and affordable place to call home? Thank you for your time and consideration. 
Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Alexandra Doherty to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Clock is ready. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Alexandra Doherty. I'm a senior staff attorney and policy counsel of the civil justice practice at Oakland Defender Services. I'd like to thank the Committees on Immigration and Housing and Buildings for giving us opportunity to testify today. I'm here to express our strong support for expanding eligibility for housing benefits and subsidies for New York City's immigrant residents. Uh, faced with dwindling supply of affordable housing, many immigrant New Yorkers are barred from accessing the federal, state, and local benefits that would help them secure stable housing. Um, as you've heard today already, many are also barred from the so-called formal housing market because landlords routinely require excessive documentation, much of which is nearly impossible to obtain without citizenship or certain legal status. Uh, without traditional documentation or identification, New Yorkers are stuck without a viable pathway to access housing, employment, or credit, uh, and they're forced to resort to informal and unsafe housing arrangements. Um, undocumented New Yorkers are at particular risk of harassment and discrimination. Uh, as you know, the unpredictable changes to immigration policy throughout the Trump administration stoked fear and uncertainty in immigrant communities. Um, and changes to the public charge rule, for example, even though they're no longer in effect, uh, we see that the chilling effects persist and many of our clients are still afraid to use public programs, even if they're eligible, um, that would help them meet basic needs. And the COVID pandemic has exacerbated these existing housing problems for our immigrant clients particularly. Uh, many were already afraid of illegal evictions and hesitant to assert their rights in housing court, uh, but the pandemic has added job loss, food insecurity, and escalating landlord harassment to that housing uncertainty. Um, without access to benefits and programs aimed at direct financial assistance or at canceling rent, uh, clients who are already in unstable living situations will face self-help evictions now while courts are closed, or they'll be evicted in holdover proceedings when landlords realize that they can't pay their back rent or access um, housing subsidies and benefits. EDS supports the resolution calling on the state to expand eligibility for scree injury uh, as an important first step. But these are narrow programs and the change would actually affect few, if any, of our clients. Um, so beyond asking the state legislature to, ask, to act, the city should also take action itself to ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, have access to safe and affordable permanent housing. Um, specifically, we recommend expanding eligibility for city FEPs, regardless of public assistance eligibility or immigration status. And we're broadly exploring and considering more uh, kinds of direct rent subsidy programs, specifically for immigrant tenants. Um, the city could also replicate the structure of the SCREE injury program and provide tax abatements to landlords who freeze the rent of low-income tenants. Um, there's no reason this type of program uh, has to be limited to disabled and senior New Yorkers in rent regulated apartments. Um, we also recommend that the city expand eligibility for supportive housing services so that our most vulnerable residents remain connected to the treatment and stability that they need. Um, so I'll, I'll direct the committees to our written testimony, which has more detailed comments and recommendations. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Alma Arias to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Clock is ready. Good afternoon, Chair Powers, Council members, and staff of the Committees on Immigration and on Buildings and Housing. My name is Alma Maria Arias, and I am the Outreach and Benefits Coordinator at Translandex Network. And today I'm here to speak on the housing disparities faced by many immigrants and how the disability rent increase exception dry program can truly help this awfully neglected community reach absolute safety and prosperity. First, I want to take, thank, take this opportunity to thank both chairpersons Menchaca and Carnegie for allowing this necessary and crucial dialogue to take place. As an organization led by and serving the TGNC NB LGBTQ population, I for one being a trans woman myself, additionally immigrant communities, including every other intersection that exists between both, 
here in New York City. Our unwavering aim is to contribute to the absolute access of our community to many of the resources and opportunities that are too often denied from. In turn, not only will this access of resources improve their lives in astronomical ways, but we believe it will ultimately empower and bolster future generations of TGNC, NB, LGBTQ, and immigrant communities in American society at large. According to Coalition for the Homeless, along with the Black community, Latino Latinx New Yorkers are disproportionately affected by homelessness, representing 32%, which almost reaches half of homeless people in the city. Additionally, according to a general population study recently published in May of 2020 by UCLA Williams Institute, 17% of sexually minority adults report having experienced homelessness in their lifetime. All these numbers are especially alarming for us given that one, this number does not even begin to accurately report the many more people who go unreported due to being undocumented. And two, while we serve immigrants from different nationalities, the Hispanic Latinx community is the demographic we by far represent in higher numbers. Immigrant communities undeniably face many of the challenges and barriers some of us privileged citizens simply do not, such as discrimination, language disparities, lower access to healthcare due to lower paying jobs without benefits, and an increase in housing cost of living, all just because of their immigration status, among many other things. These issues oftentimes lead to deeper ramifications, in turn become more unfairly compounded with more complex issues involving mental health challenges. In our experience, we have seen how the intersection of all these challenges greatly affects the immigrant community in New York, in particular, those with disabilities and chronic medical conditions. Many of our community members at Trans Latin X Network are in the process of obtaining legal immigration status, and this consequently means that they cannot have access to many of the many of the benefits That's that we have their living conditions. Given all of the aforementioned, providing access to programs like Dry would prevent many of our community members from continuing to experience homelessness and falling prey to the ever increasing issue of mental health in our country. We believe it is within the American moral fabric, your collective duty and our bound responsibility to truly uphold a brave and dignified space for our sanctuary city, our communities and our people. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'm now gonna circle back to Aura Mesha. You may begin when you're ready. Clock is ready. <laughs> Hi, uh, good afternoon everybody and thank you for inviting me today. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes, uh, my, gotcha. name, thank you. my name is Aura Mejia. I'm a tenant advocate and organizer at Neighbors Helping Neighbors in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Great part of my work is to assist tenants facing eviction, organize and provide education on tenant rights and connect them with the city and state campaigns. I work mainly with undocumented community that face harassment, lack of repairs, eviction on daily basis. And during the pandemic, tenants also were facing new challenges with their health, losing family members and losing their jobs. Um, Extending a screen and, green and rental assistance will keep tenants in their home. The majority of our community undocumented members were working in cleaning houses and small, small restaurants, babysitting, jornaleros, and we cannot forget street vendors that have been under attack. All of the hardworking immigrants have been struggling to bring food to the table and pay the rent without unemployment benefits or other benefits. Mostly all the families will be facing eviction at the end of the moratorium on May and landlords will be able to start eviction process for non-payment cases. Uh, not, qualified, not, not qualified for any benefits or any assistance as a one-shot deal. I am here today to ask you to pass and include uh, the hardworking families and disabled families from our communities and pass a funding as a screen and green that will include and protect them from eviction and adding an 
and avoid adding up numbers of homeless population in New York City. Prevention is essential. Housing is a human right. You have the power to treat with respect and de dignity and provide protection to hardworking community members that have been invisible and the most impacted by the pandemic. Or people cannot afford to move out of New York City. Think about undocumented families, mental health, and how it's going to affect children and their education too. Having a place to call home is fundamental for our children and, the, and, and disabled family members. It is time to do the right thing. I'm asking you to please pass and extend the funding for Maria, her husband and her two daughters that lost their income, for Lucia and her daughter and her granddaughter with only one income, for Susana uh, um, with no income and two children, for Veronica only working two days with two children and her mother, Esperanza with her sick child and only working two days for Teresa working three days, family members that lost half of the income. I could go on with different names that I see and I get the phone calls every day asking for help, especially undocumented tenants that are disabled and they cannot, um, they cannot um, afford any other increases. So I'm asking you to please consider them and uh, help them. Thank Time you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now turn it back to Chairman Chaka for any questions. Uh, thank you, Harbani. And I wanna say thank you to this panel. I, I think what I learned from this panel is, and, and really it's a confirmation of what the city needs to do to ensure the protections. One, as we hit the May 1st deadline, the impending lawsuit or just the, the kind of legal battles that are in front of us and that the income that is needed by so many immigrant families is real. And that's something that the city can do. And I know that there's a piece of legislation that we have to uh, ensure passes at the state to allow us to bring that kind of immediate resource uh, at the state level so that the, the state can give us access and grant us permission to create benefit program uh, like cash assistance and we can we can make that happen. So I guess my question, um, and maybe one, you know, not to create re repeating uh, statements of support, but um, I want to talk about that cash assistance need uh, as we think about access to housing and how important is cash assistance versus some of the other things that we're talking about, like um, lawyers and uh, programs that allow for affordable housing, changing some of the lottery issues. Uh, cash assistance is not, not something that we do plentiful. It's not a massive robust program, but can be if, if, if we need it. Uh, I don't know if Aura, you wanna start and or um, who else brought it up? I think Legal Aid Society brought it up as well. Is there anybody that can wanna to speak to the importance of cash assistance? I think cash assisting is very important, but one of the things too is the fear that people that wants to apply for um, uh, for um, immigrant status, how it's gonna affect them on their application. So it's all, always also that, that, that uh, fear from the community that any program that children will, uh, or their benefit that will affect them in the future. And you're, and you're referring to public charge. And oh, right, right, and and I think what I'm what I'm saying too is that the state legislation will allow us to to be able to do that without impact, and and how do we continue to build programs that can help immigrants uh, without impacting uh, the public charge rule? Uh, does anybody else have any specific responses to the cash assistance program or concept? Uh, Leslie Ann. Yeah, I can say thank you. I rushed a little bit. Uh, there were so many good points raised earlier by everyone, but that is really the need that I'm seeing as a as a Nesson attorney. As I mentioned, um, those that do not have a 
access to one shot deals really don't have any other option. Um, we're really looking forward to this federal rent relief that's coming through, but it's not here yet. Um, and until that happens, people, I have clients that I really, those are the cases that keep me up at night because they have no other options. Unless they get fast and grant funds, um, I don't know how their arrears will be paid. And furthermore, you know, with the slow reopening, we have no knowledge of when people are gonna be fully back to work. Um, as Aura mentioned with all of her clients, a lot of the names that she mentioned, nobody knows when they're gonna get back to work. And what we have is this situation where people are working one day a week, two days a week um, without the, income moving forward the, the eligibility to the ability to pay rent going forward that is good that's like this you know elephant that's kind of hanging over us even when we do get the funds to address the uh, the arrears how do uh, these New Yorkers pay their rent going forward and stay housed awesome thank you and if legal aid and anybody else on this call wants to join us, please reach out on this specific. I also believe that cash assistance is gonna be really critical to get the stabilization on the housing side set uh, in motion. And, as, and in addition to the legal assistance, in addition to Know Your Rights, in addition to all these other pieces, um, but I, I wanna ensure that we're moving in the right direction and that's going to be in, in partnership with all of you. So Leslie Ann, if you can reach out to us afterwards, I want to work with you and anybody else on the call about how to build something that, that is good, that anticipates issues. Like I would have said, uh, public charge to ensure that doesn't um, uh, trip over certain things that, uh, that will make it harder for other, other benefits. And, and I, so this is something I strongly believe in as well. Uh, with that, if there, are any, if there are any other council members that want to ask questions, if they're not, then we can go to the next panel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask if any council members have questions at this time, you can use a Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no other hands. Um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. Um, at this point, we have concluded our public testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use a Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called on in the order that your hand is raised. Seeing no hands, I'm going to turn it back to Chairman Chaka for closing remarks. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank Fabian uh, and Mario for coming and starting us off with their very powerful uh, testimony about how their families are being impacted. Um, their families are being supported by so many people on this call, uh, families like theirs, immigrant communities that have been essential workers keeping the city alive uh, are only asking for a sense of dignity and res real dignity and response from the city. Uh, these are tax paying immigrant workers in our city and they deserve that kind of respect. And I hope that this uh, joint hearing with Chair Cornegy and the resolution that is before us really helps shift the discussion to some action items. And I know that we left a lot of questions on the table in terms of data. Uh, we are really looking for that data to understand how the city is out there. I heard a lot of intention from the city about how they want to do what they want to do and that we're not negating. That is real. I know that the city is working really hard. The question is, how is that happening? Where is that happening? Where does it need to happen? How does it need to happen? And, and I just keep hearing over and over again that cash assistance is going to be key to stabilizing people's housing issues and as immigrants who have a long and very traumatized relationship with government, many times just bad information um, is gonna need good, good information, solid information, protections, uh, legal protections. And, and I think that the real opportunity here is through this vaccine operation that has really yet to, I think, saturate uh, into our immigrant communities. And that needs to happen for our city to reopen. And it won't happen our city will not reopen until we get to that last 20%, that last mile of, of, of community members. And that's not going to happen at a Javits where you have military operations. It's going to happen in a local CBO. Uh, and, and that's where a local CBO can, can really build 
a suite of uh, interactions that are not just housing, it's health related, it's education related, it's, it's back to the fabric of what the city is doing with good intentions, but is not reaching these community members. Uh, and, and so um, that's where, I think that's where we're ending. We are gonna follow up with more, for more information, uh, but I am, I'm heartened and um, heartened by, by the discussion today. And thank you advocates for, for the fight. Uh, thank you to our Sunset Park residents who, who started us off this conversation. Uh, and thank you, uh, Director Bay and our uh, deputy commissioners who were here today from HPD. Uh, we're going to want to really be uh, creative and we have a budget opportunity right now that we want to impact. And so that's not going to happen on its own. It's going to require a lot of advocacy on our part. Uh, so otra vez, muchas gracias a Fabian y, y Mario por su testimonio esta mañana. Um, es, es algo, es una voz que tiene poder y las ideas que ustedes tienen es, es algo que puede cambiar las vidas de otros inmigrantes, ot otros inmigrantes que no están conectados, no tienen confianza en, en el gobierno y, y que merecen uh, esa respuesta del gobierno porque son trabajadores esenciales. Uh, si tienen el trabajo, si no, um, merecen algo. Uh, y, y por eso estamos aquí. So, muchas gracias. Uh, okay, well, this is it. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this hearing. Thank you to our incredible staff: Harbani, Elizabeth, uh, Lorena, Caesar, Tony, uh, and everybody on the housing committee staff as well. Thank you so much, and we are now closed. <laughs>